Good morning, everybody. Happy Earth Day and welcome to Earth Talks. So I'm Philip Thompson. I'm the director of the Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability here at Seattle University. I'd like to welcome all of our students, staff, and faculty, as well as those of you from around the globe, including our friends at snappy.com, whose recent donation to CEJS will support the construction of bathroom facilities at a secondary school in Uyo, Nigeria. We are, of course, coming to you live from Seattle, which is the native home to the Duwamish people, who for centuries lived with the land and cared for the most vulnerable in their tribe. There's much we can learn from these original examples of living sustainably. On this 52nd Earth Day, it's my pleasure to announce our CEJS Student Fellowship recipient for the 2022-2023 academic year. The recipient of this year's Gary L. Chamberlain Fellowship will be second year law student Peter Durland, who will study the tree retention laws in Seattle. The recipient of the 2022 Francis Fellowship is Anne Dwyer, who is a graduate student in our clinical mental health counseling program. Anne's research will examine climate change, mental health, and new directions for justice-oriented crisis counseling. Congratulations to Anne and Peter, and thank you to all the students who applied for this year's fellowships. There were many worthy proposals. Today, our theme is just sustainability, and our goal is to bring hope with stories from members of our community. In this morning session, we'll have, we will have eight five-minute presentations, and then at noon, our first keynote speaker, Senator Rebecca Saldana, Seattle U Class of 99, will present her reflections on the journey to transformational justice. This will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Seattle U Student Government President Marrakesh Maxwell. Please note that there will be no Q&A for the shorter talks. To view our program, please visit earthtalks, earth-talks.org. So after the morning session, we'll take a 90 minute break and we'll begin our second session our afternoon session at 2 p.m. For those who are on campus, you can head over to the Student Center for a special Earth Day menu that's been prepared by our friends at Red Hawk Dining. And the students of Engineers for a Sustainable World are having a plant sale, so you can check out what plants they have available. And now to kick us off, we have a special message from Seattle University President Eduardo Penalve, who is in his inaugural, inaugural year here as, as our 22nd president. Eduardo is, repre is representing SU today in our nation's capital and can't be with us, but he has prepared this special video message for us. Good morning. Welcome to Seattle University's Earth Talks, part of our celebration of Earth Day 2022. The Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability at Seattle University has organized these Earth Talks for several years uh, in the first uh, year of our Earth Talks in 2020, the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we were privileged to hear a special message from Earth Day's founder, Dennis Hayes. In commemorating Earth Day every year, Seattle University honors its deepest held values as a university that is simultaneously innovative and progressive and Jesuit and Catholic. For example, in their universal apostolic preferences adopted in 2019, the Society of Jesus called on Jesuit institutions around the world, like Seattle University, to find new ways to care for our common home, the earth, and to walk with the poor and marginalized among us. And our observance of Earth Day is also responsive to Pope Francis's call in his pathbreaking encyclical Laudato Si to work towards a more sustainable future. Seattle University's commitment to sustainability and to advancing environmental justice therefore align with these core Jesuit and Catholic values. In addition, as Seattle's university, Seattle University reflects the progressive culture of environmental care that is so pervasive here in the Pacific Northwest. Addressing questions of sustainability and climate change will surely require all the innovation we can muster. And so this celebration brings together every element of our vision to be a university that is innovative, progressive, and Jesuit and Catholic. As a university, we are also committed to living out these values in a number of concrete ways. 
In addition to being the first Jesuit university in the world to commit to 100% fossil fuel divestment, Seattle University has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by almost 20% since 2009. We're currently developing a plan that will completely eliminate our campus's use of natural gas. Until that plan can be fully implemented, though, we will continue to take responsibility for our direct greenhouse gas emissions by purchasing high-quality carbon offsets that have multiple environmental and social benefits. Because of our efforts, Seattle University is nationally recognized for our commitment to sustainability. Sierra Club has ranked us as one of its top 15 cool schools, the highest ranking achieved by any university in the Pacific Northwest. These are powerful forms of witness, but as a university, the most important way that we can pave the way for a sustainable future is, and I'll here paraphrase our university's mission statement, by empowering leaders for a just and humane world. In other words, by educating our students and the broader community and by giving them the tools they need to lead us forward into a sustainable future. In goal one of our reignited strategic directions, we've committed ourselves to reimagining our curriculum in order to ensure that a Seattle University education prepares our students to grapple with the great challenges they will face when they begin their studies and their journeys into leadership. And key among these are the challenge of climate change and the need to build a sustainable future. So once again, welcome. Thank you for participating in this celebration of Earth Day and enjoy today's Earth Talks. Thank you, President Penalve, for that video presentation. And now to get us kicked off is Anna Robertson. I'm gonna refrain from reading bios. You can read all of our speaker bios at earth-talks.org. Um, and so you, you may have uh, recognized Anna's song that we played if you joined us earlier. Uh, it's a beautiful song and really appreciate uh, that contribution uh, as, as well as from Alex Chapman. We played one of his songs from last year, which he wrote for Earth Talks last year. So Anna, hopefully you can share your screen. And if you can't, we can we can figure that out. So I'm gonna let you take it away, thanks. Thank you and no need for screen sharing on my part. I will just be talking. My name is Anna Robertson and I'm Director of Youth and Young Adult Mobilization for Catholic Climate Covenant. Thanks for having me today. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. That dominion part though, that's the rub, isn't it? This verse of course comes from the book of Genesis shared as a sacred text among Christians and Jews the world over. It's been at the root of a lot of debate in recent years and for good reason. This divine directive of human dominion has been misused for generations to justify human domination of the earth. Even Pope Francis, who occupies the highest seat of authority in the Catholic Church in the midst of our missteps, saying that, quote, an inadequate presentation of Christian anthropology gave rise to a wrong understanding of the relationship between human beings and the world, end quote, one characterized by mastery and domination. Rather than domination, he writes that we should understand dominion to be more akin to stewardship. And this is, in fact, a perfectly valid interpretation of the scriptural text. According to Catholic theologian Elizabeth Johnson, in its historical context, one who exercised dominion was one who'd been appointed by a ruler to carry out the ruler's will in faraway lands. So if in this metaphor, God is the ruler, what is God's will for creation? to be fruitful and multiply, to flourish and thrive. So if God's will is that creation flourish and to ensure that is to exercise dominion, then dominion sure sounds a lot like stewardship to me. I have to admit though, for most of my life, the idea of stewardship hasn't exactly gotten me excited. It rings of a certain paternalism, not to mention irony in the face of how drastically off course we human beings have managed to steer the ship when it comes to land management. Burning all of the fossil fuels we currently have on reserve would alone put us perilously close to the critical threshold identified in the recent IPCC reports of two degrees Celsius of atmospheric warming. And yet our governments continue to approve new extractive efforts. Some stewards, huh? It's no wonder that there's this increasing sense among people these days that the best thing that human beings could do for the planet is to allow ourselves to go extinct. It's hard to imagine that humans could have a neutral impact, let alone a positive one, 
on our ecosystems in the face of so much devastation. Now here's the part where I get really quiet and serious and I lean in and I look you in the eye and I tell you that I see all the fear that you carry. I carry it too. And the despair, I too have known it. And the anger, how dare they leave us this world and the helplessness. How could I ever possibly make a difference? And I tell you this, we are not beyond redemption. It's not only possible for us to nurture our ecosystems toward wholeness, it's within our very nature to do so. And we human beings have been doing so for generations. Take the Amazon rainforest, often held up as the quintessential example of untouched wilderness. The incredible biodiversity that we find there today is in fact due in part to generations of active stewardship on the part of indigenous peoples there. Likewise, much of the land in the present day United States was not true wilderness upon its violent colonization by my European ancestors, but was in fact consciously cultivated by indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples of course are not monolithic and you can find plenty of historical examples of groups that exceeded the limits of their ecosystems. Yet it remains the case that today, while only comprising about 6% of the world's population, indigenous peoples steward 80% of its biodiversity. Often among the hardest hit by climate change, indigenous people and the knowledge they've nurtured for generations are crucial to the fight against climate change. So it's precisely because the message of Christianity has been twisted to justify the plundering of the earth that those of us who belong to and choose to remain within the church must excavate the depths of our tradition for the liberating messages buried there. Today, thanks to the modeling of indigenous communities past and present, as well as that of modern movements around permaculture and regenerative agriculture, I find stewardship to be one of the most hopeful ways of envisioning our human vocation. We're not beyond redemption. The planet's best hope is not our extinction or even our neutrality. We can, in fact, relearn to be beneficial species in our planetary ecosystem. The call to nurture our ecosystems toward wholeness and thriving is embedded in our wisdom traditions and in our DNA. So let us make ourselves students of our common home so that as kin among kin, we might reclaim our calling to nurture creation toward flourishing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Our next speaker will be one of our students, Emily Tack, who will talk about community space, community gardens and green spaces in Seattle. Emily, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily. Um, I've been working with Dr. Heidi Leary this year as her research assistant, and we've been studying the effect of green spaces on community gardens. Studying urban gardens is important because community gardeners can provide food sovereignty in low-income neighborhoods, community engagement and enrichment, and greater, more equitable access to fresh organic produce. Studying green spaces near community gardens is important because green space offers refuge for beneficial insects like pollinators who visit gardens. So the more green space near a garden means the more ecosystem services provided to the garden. Um, and these services include pollination and pest control. However, historically, green spaces have been inequitably distributed in urban areas with low income neighborhoods having less access to green space. Um, so the less access to green space these neighborhoods have, the less ecosystem services provided to community gardeners who might need it the most. We also looked at what gardeners grow inside their gardens because the composition of the gardens affect the resources available to beneficial insects. Um, these insects were affected by floral resources, plant diversity, and plant cover. Um, a gardener's income level also might affect their choices on how, ornament, how many ornamental plants or crops they grow, as well as how they manage weeds. So the picture um, in the top shows a garden with lots of ornamental plants and floral resources, and the picture in the bottom shows a garden with mostly crops. So here are research questions. We wanted to look at the relationship between the income level of the neighborhood where the garden was located and the abundance of our different green space variables. Um, those variables were parks, natural habitat, canopy cover, and impervious surface cover. 
We also investigated how income level influenced the abundance of ornamental plants, crops, and weed species within the gardens. Our methods. So we use 86 of the Seattle Pea Patch Program's gardens as our study sites. Um, to determine the proportion of green space near each garden, I used ArcGIS software to run spatial analysis to find the abundance of our green space variables within 500 meters of each garden. So this is a picture to the right. We also collected vegetation data in 10 sample gardens. Um, this is pictured to the right to determine what was being, what was being grown inside each garden. Our results. Um, so this figure shows how income influences canopy cover to the left, um, parks in the middle, and natural and semi-natural habitat to the right. So we found that income had a slightly statistically significant effect on canopy cover, meaning as income increased, so did canopy cover surrounding the gardens. Um, there was no relationship between income and parks and no relationship between income and natural habitat. This graph shows the effect of income on low, medium, and high intensity impervious cover within 500 meters of each garden. Um, and we found that income does not affect impervious cover. Um, there is no relationship. This graph shows our results um, on plant composition within the gardens. So we found that as income increased, so did the number of ornamental species on the left. Um, same for crop species in the middle, but this result was not statistically significant. Um, and there's no relationship between income and the number of weed species in the garden. All that to say, the city of Seattle does an adequate job of distributing green space around community gardens, um, but there were inequities in the distribution of canopy cover. Looking at how income influences what's grown inside the gardens, we found that high income gardens tended to have more ornamental species and thus more floral resources for beneficial organisms. So Seattle could compensate for this gap in floral resources in low income gardens by planting more flowers and ornamental plants in and around community gardens. So thank you to the Pea Patch Program. And this work was funded by the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust Grant. And if you have questions, let me know. This is my email. Thank you so much, Emily. Nice job there. Very interesting stuff. So our next speaker will be Gabriella Robinson, who is going to talk about her project, Our Home, a climate story video series. So Gabby, it's all you. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Alrighty, hi everybody, happy Earth Day. Um, I am a SU student um, and I, this is one of a, this is one of the films from a four part series that um, is premiering today. This is the first time that anybody um, is gonna be able to watch these films. Um, so I'm gonna be previewing one of them, talking a little bit about um, the film and the project and what it all means, and then giving you a little bit of the insider scoop information on where you can see the rest of the series. So enjoy. My name is Gabriella Batinich. I am an environmental studies major. I'm a sophomore. I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, and this injustice is occurring from Alberta, Canada, all the way into the headwaters of Lake Superior, where I'm from. In my state, we have an existing pipeline, Line 3, and over the past six years, Enbridge has been working to rebuild this pipeline. This new pipeline runs through multiple indigenous lands, multiple wild rice fields, which is a sacred plant for um, all Anishinaabe tribes in Minnesota. And it also crosses the Mississippi River twice, not once, but twice. Um, very problematic that runs through our entire country. So uh, if something were to go wrong there, people in Louisiana would be feeling its effects. And also ends at our largest freshwater source in the world next to Lake Baikal. Lake Superior, um, it's it's like an ocean for Midwesterners, so it feels very special to me, and I just, I, when I'm home when I'm there. So a lot of indigenous leaders are on the front lines protesting this, 
When people are putting their bodies on the line, it's really one of the most effective things they can do to um, stop this process at the source and allow court cases to be heard, allow media to gain attention at what's going on, and um, bring awareness to indigenous rights and to building a more sustainable environment for, for our state and for the country and everywhere. I feel hopeful looking to indigenous folks. They've been putting up the food in this fight for so many years and they never lose hope. This could set a precedent for what a sustainable world looks like. Minnesota could hopefully be a beacon of environmental justice, environmental advocacy, and something really beautiful. Um, big shout out to Gabriella Batnich for starring um, in one of these pieces. Um, she's going to be talking at the afternoon session today, and she also um, won the Earth Month logo contest. So anytime you see um, anything that's Earth Month affiliated with the CEJS, um, she made that logo. So hats off to Gabby. Um, so this, this project was um, a, a, like I said, a four part series that kind of goes and talks about um, how SU students have personal impacts to climate change. And the real focus that this, that this project had was really trying to um, not only raise the awareness, but just help people kind of open up their eyes to the world around them to seeing how common um, the effects and impacts of climate change and what those can look like. I think typically in the media, we see climate change as being these like really big um, heavy weighted events, such as like a wildfire or a hurricane or something. Um, but as we kind of dive more into the science and the reasoning and just even the time behind it, we can learn that there are so many smaller micro changes that happen as a result of it that everybody is impacted by. Um, and so that is really the big fundamental thing that this series is trying to bring is awareness to that extent, um, connection, and also hope. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the film that you just saw specifically, which is um, of Gabby's um, and how that relates with um, the ongoing fight with um, Line 3 in Duluth, Minnesota, Minnesota and with the Ashinaabe tribe. Um, I, the reason that I'm presenting this one is because this was one of the, uh, the one of the, out of the four part films that I, um, I filmed myself and um, got to spend a lot of time researching and connecting to um, present this film to you. And with it, um, I went into it just not thinking that I would ever have a connection to um, what was going on in Duluth, Minnesota, being from California. But as I was learning more about um, the connections and the impacts of why Line 3 is so bad, why Enbridge Oil is so terrible, and just the repeated abuse that had been going on with the Anache um, Anishinaabe tribe, it just became so evident that there were so many different hidden things that I had never realized that I needed to open my eyes up to um, and find that connection to being able to support a group of people, um, an individual and a community that are across the country from me. Um, and being able to have that connection really presented an extra level of intimacy that I, I found with my subject with filming this as well. Um, and just really being able to see like what the person is really passionate about, um, what they continue to fight for and what gives them happiness and what gives them hope. And that in turn gave me a lot of hope as well. Um, and another piece of the project that continued to give me more hope as well was the like the personal side effects of, of the climate grief and climate anxiety that I, I had when I was making this project itself. And we don't really talk about climate anxiety or climate grief as much as we should. Um, and over the course of the year and a half when I was making this project, I found that um, I, I just found that there was a lot of like a, a burden and, and a weight whenever I would be editing and, and trying to create this project just because it was something that I felt like had a really big weight and a presence on me. Um, and trying to navigate through that, I felt, I found just to be super difficult, um, until like a couple of extraneous things in my life ended up happening that I was able to just like work it all out and push through it. And with that, I found that the need for self-care and taking care of myself is 
so, so, so important in relation to being able to do anything, climate change, environmental justice and justice related or not, um, which really just reinstilled that in order to take care of others, we need to make sure that we take our take care of ourselves first um, and make that a priority. So um, thank you again for watching one of the four parts of this series and the video will um, along with the other videos will be found, I believe, um, I think Yolanda just popped a, yeah, she just popped a link in the chat. It will be um, on the CEJS website. I'm going to assume that it's in the same website link as the panelists for Earth Talks. And if you have any questions, comments for me, um, I'll go ahead and pop my email into the chat as well. Thank you so much. So much, Gabby. Great job with your series. So our next speaker is Altani Bisht, who will talk, talk to us about uh, their project, Does Renewable Energy and Battery Storage Green the Electric Grid? So Altani, it's all you. Thank you. I hope the audio is OK. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Awesome. Um, good morning. I'm Altani Bisht. I'm a graduate student from Department of Computer Science at Seattle University. And my talk today will answer the question, does renewable energy and battery storage green the electric grid? So electricity generators cater to the goods manufacturers, data centers, and residential consumers. Uh, these electricity generators provide power for heating in winters and air condition cooling in summers. But this demand for more power on the grid has been rapidly increasing with remote work and high definition video calling. And some of the largest tech contributors are also uh, video streaming and Bitcoin mining. In fact, electric cars are also expected to further increase the demand for this electricity exponentially. So what are the trends and solutions uh, that are there to address this demand for more power? I will briefly discuss the energy storage patterns, battery storage in front and behind of the meters, uh, peak prices and optimization on battery charging, discharging algorithm. And I will also present my research findings of carbon footprint from a greedy against an optimized uh, solution. So uh, energy usage pattern. So every day has peak hours and off peak hours. What are peak hours? Uh, these are usually daytime hours, learn like uh, the late in the day, early evening, when most people are working like in factories or offices. And off-peak hours are late night or early uh, morning hours. So these high peak in demand for few hours force the electricity grids to generate more power for that duration. This instantaneous demand is actually met by carbon resources like petroleum, natural gas, biogas, and even coal. And this is because the renewable energy sources like solar, wind, hydro, they cannot produce such instantaneously high power output. And neither can nuclear, you know, which can only produce a uniform uh, output power throughout the day. So this is an everyday phenomena in all grids across the world. And presented here is a, a California ISO uh, grid fuel mix and carbon emission for a particular day in July 2020 for reference. So you can see as soon as the uh, carbon rich fuel is added to the uh, fuel mix, the uh, carbon emission shoots up by many fold uh, of magnitude. You know, this, this hole is uh, catering for this much increase in uh, fuel. So um, let's analyze how the electricity generators and grid providers cater to this, uh, you know, the rise in peak demands. So uh, the simplest approach that we just saw is to burn more fuel. But this is also the most expensive approach because crude oil and natural gas is more expensive than renewable sources like uh, solar farms and wind farms, which usually have a high set of costs, but then essentially run for free afterwards. A second solution is that these grid providers store the excess renewable energy generated in a kind of a large scale battery and then release this extra energy during peak demand hours. So uh, this process is actually uh, in practice in some of the regions like California ISO itself, but it does not meet the scale of ever increasing uh, demand. And the third and most effective solution which uh, electricity grid providers uh, adopt is to charge a peak penalty from consumers who make high peaking demands. So this is called demand charge. And, it, and this has been a cause of concern for most industries since it significantly adds a large portion of money in their uh, electricity bills. So uh, let's see the problem from the consumers or the industry's point of view. So now they have to pay thousands of uh, dollars as peak penalty in addition to already paying for the uh, for their overall consumption in the electricity bill. So shown here is like a regular working day in an industry. And you can see there are several non-deterministic peaks. 
and these peaks uh, will actually cost the company hefty amount in electricity bill. Uh, so what can the industry do to save on their peak prices? Uh, you know, industries like manufacturing plants or data centers, they can either cut their peaks by making sure the energy consumption does not cross the threshold, or they can source their own solar panels and uh, meet the rise in demand. But unfortunately, none of these solutions meet the short-term short objective of uh, keeping investment low, uh, giving them quick returns. So what they do is to have a battery-based solution, which provides uh, the option to store and charge uh, in the batteries when the demand is high in, that, in their industry. So, uh, so basically, they consume from the battery instead of uh, consuming from the main grid line. So they kind of escape the peak penalty charges. Right? And these are some of the battery solutions which are uh, available in the market. So we established that uh, the industries are focused, now focusing towards using batteries uh, to kind of you know, meet their electricity uh, demands. So let's see the problem uh, that will come up in future, it has already started coming up, is that they charge during the night uh, when the prices are low and then they consume from the battery during the day. So this is like a, a greedy uh, charge discharge cycle. Um, so, but by charging in the uh, night, they are actually creating a demand peak in the night. And the battery charge in the night is also getting charged from the carbon rich fuels. So it's not really greening, uh, it's not really resulting in any carbon, uh, uh, it's not decreasing the carbon at all. Uh, so the batteries also are made using the rare earth metals like lithium cobalt, the manufacturing, recycling cost of these batteries, the uh, reduction in reduction cost in, by the round trip efficiency of the battery over its lifetime because it decreases in efficiency over its life and um, it kind of increases in an increase in consumption from the main gate because the battery has to be stored and discharged from the battery that is not 100 percent it is 90 percent efficient in doing that so overall we can see that the battery storage trend is leading to an increase in carbon footprint by millions of kg of co2 equivalent so uh, now I can present MinBills, which is an optimization formulation that minimizes the electricity bills that I was talking about. Uh, and it also considers the raw electricity demand, the peak prices, and the objective was to uh, minimize the electricity bill, uh, but also do peak shaving. Um, so these are some of the experimental uh, uh, experiments that I did from for some grids and some industries. Uh, the blue one shows raw consumption. The later two graphs shows an optimized consumption using MinBills in different regions using different pricing plans. Um, so in short, the findings show that this optimization can successfully cut peak demands by 17.5%, which successfully uh, increases gains uh, on return of investment. And some other benefits of the algorithms are also here, which show that the battery-based storage with optimization and a hybrid pricing plan can be actually profitable to uh, users. But even a smart battery-based storage system uh, a demand charge reduction system cannot meet the targets of uh, simultaneously shaving the demands, providing profit, profitability and reducing the carbon footprint as well. But my experiments show that some regions with hybrid peak pricing uh, show lesser carbon emission than other regions with you know, time of use based uh, pricing policy. So this optimization uh, uh, works uh, by many order of magnitude better than a simple battery storage uh, solution in, in curbing the carbon footprint. So, uh, and using the fuel mix of various ISOs uh, around US, I was able to uh, show that the carbon footprint for a large industry increases by up to 9% using our MinBills uh, optimization uh, framework. So, so let's address the problem. Why isn't a uh, battery storage uh, system able to reduce the carbon footprint? Uh, so this is because of the lithium battery itself. The carbon uh, footprint of the battery is 100 grams CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Uh, and also because of the battery inefficiencies. So to answer my question, does renewable energy and battery storage green the electric grid? Well, the answer is no, not yet. Uh, with this, I conclude my talk. Uh, these are some of my research and uh, findings, uh, some of the libraries which I open source for carbon prediction. Uh, this is, second, um, and this is uh, Project Tamudroid, which is a robot that identifies and picks up garbage autonomously. Then the version eight of this robot is under, con under construction by me and my team at Seattle University. And that's it, you can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Altane. Very interesting to see the innovation of using battery storage to help us reduce our carbon emissions. 
So we've had a few students speak for the last few talks. So now we're gonna turn it over to one of our faculty members, Dr. Tanya Hayes, who's gonna discuss evaluating the sustainability of carbon offsets and similar payments for environmental services. And so uh, Tanya, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Um... Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Tanya Hayes. Yeah, I'm a professor here at Seattle University. And today I'm going to be sharing part of some of the research that myself and Dr. Felipe Mortino have been doing, evaluating the sustainability of payment for environmental service programs. I'm not sure how familiar you all are with payment for environmental services, but perhaps the most common are carbon offset programs. So specifically those in which you make payments to protect forests uh, for carbon sequestration. And what we've been looking at is specifically community-based programs. And I'm gonna share results from a program that was implemented in Ecuador. So and in this program, rural communities in the highlands of Ecuador decided whether they collectively wanted to sign contracts, in this case with the Ecuadorian government, in which the government said they would give them payments uh, twice per year on the condition that they provide environmental services. And specifically in this case, that meant conserving their communal lands uh, to help with carbon offsets, watershed protection, and biodiversity. And in conserving these lands, it meant that they would take their cattle off and also not practice agriculture. So there's a lot of concerns around payment for environmental service programs, uh, and they're under quite a bit of debate. But our two concerns I wanna focus on here today was first, do community payments produce additional conservation behaviors? So in those communities where they signed into this program, did you see households actually change their behavior to provide these additional environmental services? And then second, what happens when payments stop? So in many cases, ultimately these payment programs are going to end and a concern is how payments may be impacting internal motivations and whether or not they may be creating a no pay, no care attitude in the recipients. So our work is from, as I said, the Highlands in Ecuador. I'll be sharing data here from 2008 to 2018. The program started in 2009. And specifically, we look at the impact on payments to reduce grazing, which was the greatest threat to the watersheds and also the ability for these communal lands to sequester carbon. Payments, was, as I said, started in 2009, but stopped unexpectedly in 2015. So what have we found? Well, first, with the question about whether or not payments produce additional conservation behaviors, we found that yes, they did. Uh, so our study looked at communities, and households in communities that had joined this PEST program as compared to a control set of households that had not. And as you can see in 2008, before the program, both had roughly the same percent of households grazing in their communal lands. But what we found was four years into the program, those that were participating had significantly reduced their grazing uh, as compared to the control. And in fact, grazing had been reduced by an additional 12%. With respect to the question of what happens when payments stop. So in 2015, the Ecuadorian government unexpectedly lost funding and that meant that they stopped paying communities um, their biannual payments. We came in in 2018 and so communities had about two to three years without receiving payments and we wanted to see what had happened. And as you can see here in the chart, when compared to control communities, we find that grazing still continued to decrease and furthermore, we found no evidence that in fact, households were now returning their cattle to these conservation lands. So the question here is why do they still comply? Uh, and it's important to note in interviews with households and with community leaders, there was a lot of frustration about the lack of payments, uh, stated loss of motivation, as well as stated loss of trust in the program. Nonetheless, they said we didn't find any evidence of households taking their cows and bringing them back into these communal lands. And there's a number Daddy. of reasons for that. But three that I wanna highlight are first, that the program goals largely align with the community goals for sustainable development. So communities stated that they joined this program because they saw the value of their watersheds, of their communal lands for watershed protection. And they wanted to find ways to further encourage other households to uh, practice greater conservation of these lands. 
And in doing so, the program also helped build on communities' own organizational capacities and their desire to make stronger land use rules. And so it supported uh, community rulemaking and management of their land. And then finally, something that's important to consider is many households had to sell their cattle in order to comply with these pest restrictions. And so it wasn't so easy for them to put their cows back on the land when the payment stopped. So overall, what we found was, yes, this program has been successful with respect to the environmental benefits that it's been providing. I wanna end though, however, with a caveat saying, yes, it's been beneficial for the environment, but we need to take a closer look at what happens when these payments stop for the communities that have been depending on them. Um, there's a lot of social justice and equity concerns there, but that's another talk for another day and discussion. So thank you. Much, Tanya. It gives me hope. Your research gives me hope that uh, this, this really can work. So, uh, so our next speaker is Liz Colavecchio, who is a, another student at Seattle University, who's going to discuss an exploration of sustainable death care. So Liz, it's all you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Liz Colavecchio and my presentation is called An Exploration of Sustainable Death Care. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm aware this is a sensitive topic for many people and I absolutely understand if some are not comfortable discussing death care topics that, um, but there could also be some information that could make you more comfortable with that, these ideas and is possibly worth hearing. To begin, the picture on the left is an image of me on my first day as an employee of the only funeral home in Juneau, Alaska. Throughout my time there, I helped with the posthumous care of around 150 people. And of those people who chose burial, the Hercules burial vault, pictured to the right, was an occurrence in almost every one. The thing about this vault is that although many people imagine that when they are buried, they will decompose and return to the planet, this is not the case with modern funeral practices. Instead of decomposition or a presumed return to dust, what is marketed instead is permanence, protection, and peace of mind, when in reality, these things should worry you. The main point of my presentation is that if you care about the health of the planet, you should care about how your death is handled. To illustrate the environmental impact of these choices, a study done by Smithsonian researchers showed that the average 10-acre cemetery holds enough embalming fluid to fill a small swimming pool. Can you advance to the next slide, please? These impacts last hundreds of years, making surrounding groundwater undrinkable and often toxic. Cremation with its high carbon emissions is often not much better, especially when it's often the most financially accessible option and therefore millions are performed every year. While these practices have their place when certain circumstances of grief or reconstruction are considered, it's important to understand what your options really are. Websites like washingtonfuneral.org, the homepage which is pictured there, are great resources when understanding what is legal, especially as a resident of Washington. It's also important to understand that in most cases, legislation around funeral practices is informed under the often false assumption that the deceased human body is dangerous and not with sustainability at its forefront. What is at the forefront of the death care movement is known as human composting. Please advance to the next slide. This process essentially uses mulch-like material to begin the decomposition process, and then a body is placed in a natural cemetery where a traditional headstone is optional. If you're looking for more information on this, I would recommend the Recompose facility in Kent, Washington that opened its doors in 2020. While these practices are still limited, choosing things like a more eco-friendly casket, a shroud, or planting a tree in a loved one's memory are also great options. Additionally, if you're looking for lighter resources, I would highly recommend the work of mortician Caitlin Dowdy, who is known as Ask a Mortician on YouTube, um, or Dr. Mary Roach, whose book is pictured here. Specifically, Dowdy's book, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs, answers a lot of questions that people commonly have or are apprehensive to ask about why death affects the environment, and it is a great place to start if you're curious about what is known as the green death movement as a whole. A lot of these questions are also asked by children and can make the topic more approachable as a whole. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you'll consider how death is just another way that your individual life affects the overall health of the planet. 
Um, if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. My email is just my full name at gmail.com and I am happy to talk about it because I love this subject. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liz. Our next speaker is also a student, Taylor McKenzie, who will talk about gender diversity and farm leadership. So Taylor, the floor is yours. There we go. Hello. My name is Taylor Kaili McKenzie. I am from Oahu, Hawaii, um, and I am proud to be Kanaka Maoli, which means Native Hawaiian. Um, I am a senior double majoring in environmental studies and women, gender, and sexuality studies. This project is a part of my departmental honors thesis, which will be published in June of this year. I'm also very excited to announce that this August, I will be an environmental justice graduate student at the University of Michigan in the Sustainable Foods Systems Fellowship. All right, this presentation is adapted from a poster I presented at Yale University's New Horizons in Conservation Conference, which highlights justice, equity, diversity, and sustainability. As a note, this presentation uses the label woman broadly to encompass individuals who identify as cisgender, non-binary, and other marginalized gender, gender identities. The term women in this project was chosen for ease of use and to support readers' access to the information in this presentation. It is not meant to dissuade other gender identities from seeing themselves represented today. Of course, simply saying this is not enough to recognize or honor the experiences of non-binary and gender queer individuals. The issue of non-binary representation is one that is perpetuated by several patriarchal systems in the fields of agriculture and other disciplines like feminism. So this is kind of the main part of my research results. Um, this poster examines gender disparity between acreage owned by female primary producers and male primary producers. A primary producer is the main person making decisions for farm operations, which may include planning, harvesting, livestock, management, and more. This is the highest leadership position identified by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, their census, and is used in this project to demonstrate the immense difference in farmland owned and operated by men versus women. As a note, the number of female general producers is often higher than the number of female primary producers. This may indicate that women have other roles in agriculture not related to leadership. However, this number is still low and demonstrates that the agriculture sector is male dominated. As we can see from these noticeable states, there's a very large disparity in states with the highest acreage owned by women compared to men even like the highest, the state with the highest acreage owned by female primary producers isn't even as high as the state, like the third highest state for um, acreage owned by men. So why is this important? Agriculture is one of the main sources of employment worldwide. And globally, women make up 43% of all agriculture workers. Gender inequality in agriculture leadership is a result of limited access to land and sources of monetary and physical support that are necessary for operating a farm. This is caused by historic structures that rely upon a foundation of patriarchy that emphasizes male leadership over other relevant qualifications. It is important to analyze agriculture justice through a gendered lens because prior studies have demonstrated that given the same access and support that their male counterparts have access to, women are just, if not more productive than other producers. By withholding support to potential female primary producers, the agriculture system as a whole is made inefficient and unable to provide for the highest number of people as possible. Future studies should take, into, take an intersectional approach and review how individuals who identify outside the two gender binary are impacted by gendered stereotypes when trying to access land. This data was not available, nor is it currently being collected by the USDA. Additionally, due to time restraints, this project is not 
take into consideration racial barriers to agriculture. However, this does greatly impact who is able to access leadership roles on farms and which communities are prioritized in local food systems. For example, in her book, Farming While Black, Leah Penniman, demonstrated here, wrote that in 1910, at the height of Black land ownership, 16 million acres of farmland, 14% of the total, was owned and cultivated, cultivated by Black families. Now, less than 1% of farms are Black owned. This is an obvious gap in wealth and farmland ownership that needs to be further studied through a gendered lens, but we just don't have the intersectional data being collected by the USDA at this moment. Um, agriculture feeds employees and nourishes communities across the planet. However, it is plagued by harmful structures that perpetuate gender discrimination. And in order to make it as efficient as possible to feed the most amount of people and to help the planet, we need to prioritize the leadership of BIPOC women. Thank you so much. And if you have any further questions, you can email me here. Thanks so much, Taylor. And congratulations on your graduate fellowship to Michigan. It seems like yesterday you were a first year at SDO. So well done. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So our, our next speaker before our keynote address will be by Guillermo Rogel who's gonna to talk to us about environmental justice in the Washington State Legislature. And Guillermo is with a fantastic organization called Front and Centered. If you don't know about Front and Centered, I encourage you to check it out. So Guillermo, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much to uh, Seattle University for the invitation. Um, we're really happy to be here. Uh, so my name is uh, Guillermo Rogel and I'm the Legislative and Government um, Affairs Advocate with Front and Centered. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what we'll cover today, but um, so it'll first be an introduction to our coalition, then an overview of what legislative advocacy means to us, and um, talking specifically about the state legislature and the HEAL Act, which um, I'm sure Senator Saldana, um, sponsor of the bill, will give you a little bit more deep dive into um, as the bill gets implemented. And then lastly, just cover that um, environmental justice doesn't end with passage of the HEAL Act, uh, but we're obviously super happy that it's now getting implemented and celebrate that the council had its first meeting. So just a really quick overview of who we are. Um, Front and Centered is a coalition of um, communities of color and community-based organizations, um, about 70 across Washington state, all working towards the intersection of equity, environmental, and climate justice. Um, for us, we recognize that the climate crisis is here um, and we, we really need climate solutions that are really gonna um, put our communities at our frontline communities who are impacted by pollution first and worst um, we really need to center our solutions around them because um, folks are going to feel the impacts of this climate crisis as they already are differently. Um, whether you're higher income, um, depending where you live in the state, you're exposed to different kinds of pollution. Um, and we want to make sure that as we transition away from fossil fuels, um, frontline communities um, are the ones who are being um, asked about what kind of solutions they want to see, what's working in their community. So for us, in order to get that kind of information, information from our communities, we do a lot of listening um, and education sessions with our members. So it's, it's meeting folks where they're at, um, whether we need to talk to them after work um, on weekends, build it into their schedule somehow. Um, we are connecting with community members to see um, what are the issues that they're facing and what are some of the innovative, maybe creative ways that they're working towards um, environmental justice in their communities. Um, and we have a great staff who are different policy leads on energy, transportation, um, local pollution prevention. Um, and this staff really helps resource our community members who one might not have time to do all of this research um, or, or just don't know that this kind of work exists. So we're really trying to build in community there. Um, so for us, we're really grounded in our collective future and it's, it's really about change in power. And I think, that looks differently for a lot of people. Um, so when we're talking about policy reform or even just revolution, we have to recognize that there are gonna be really diverse tactics and ideas coming from our communities that we have to absorb into our advocacy in the state legislature. Um, and we know that uh, power lies with the people. So as we work in, with institutions such as the state legislature, 
we know that people give institutions their power and legitimacy. And that's what we wanna do is empower our members to take action. And just recognize that they can take away that power too, whether it's um, through elections running for office themselves, um, we know that the power lies with our community members. Um, I think just for the sake of time, I'll just show this slide is the state legislature is made up of 137 members. And if you're curious, here is the, the, the breakup of Democrats and Republicans um, in the Senate and the House. And we obviously have elections coming up in November, which could change um, these majorities or just um, the numbers here. So a really quick overview of the HEAL Act and how it came to be. Um, this was a direct consultation with our community members who wanted to build in environmental justice into state law and also make sure that state agencies are working on environmental justice. Um, prior to the HEAL Act, um, there were very few agencies, um, and I'm thinking specifically of ecology, who were working on environmental justice and, and made it a priority. Now with the HEAL Act, we help define environmental justice, but are also building it in into their strategic plans, into their decision making, into their funding processes. And a lot of that is going to come through our Environmental Justice Council, um, which I encourage you all to look up. Um, the members just got appointed um, this winter in January and have their first meeting um, on April 4th with their next one coming up in May. And this is a community-led council, which is going to be providing recommendations to agencies um, on their request legislation, um, among other things. I think I'll, I'll leave this one for, for now because um, I know Senator Saldana and David Mendoza will talk about the HEAL Act and how it's getting implemented. But I think I just wanna cover that. We know that environmental justice is not gonna end just by defining it and having seven state agencies along with three other ones who opted in um, to just adopt HEAL and that's the end of it. Uh, for us, environmental justice means reversing the harm that exists and then also targeting funding um, targeting solutions to communities most impacted that will actually reduce our carbon emissions. Um, that's, that's our goal is reduce health disparities, reduce our carbon emissions. If the policies don't do that, it's, it's not something that we can support. Um, one of the big programs that just got established is the Climate Commitment Act, which has provisions of the HEAL Act and environmental justice into it. Um, and that's something that we're gonna follow um, to make sure that environmental justice and the decision-making processes around that um, actually follows um, community members. And among other things is, is also different climate initiatives need to build in environmental justice. It can't just be a climate solution that is that is a very like that creates a new program or funding. If community members weren't consulted, if if funding isn't directed to where it needs to go. Um, so for example, the 16 billion transportation 16 billion dollar transportation package that just passed, um, we were working to make sure that it helped reduce emissions, and then it also provided funding to, to areas like public transit um, and active transportation. So um, there's much more going on in the state legislature. I think folks are really prioritizing and talking about it now as, as the building in EJ into all climate initiatives. I think that's beginning. Um, we just have to make sure that as folks talk about EJ, um, that they're including community members in that. Um, and that they're really following their lead. So I'll leave it there um, and just encourage you all to, um, yeah, just take a look at our website. And we have a lot of great resources for community members on the organizing front, on policy. Um, and yeah, feel free to connect with me. Um, and here is my email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. So now I, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for our keynote address, who is Marrakesh Maxwell. Marrakesh is the president of Seattle University Student Government, and she's also graduating soon in June with a double major in public affairs and environmental studies. So Marrakesh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone to the third annual Earth Talks. This is incredibly exciting and lovely to have you all here. Um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction of our first keynote speaker today, Senator Saldana. Um, Senator Saldana is a Washington State Deputy Majority Leader and represents the 37th Legislative District. She's a proud Chicana of Mexican and German roots, where she grew up in the Dell Ridge neighborhood of Seattle. She's also lived and worked primarily in Seattle and Oregon. 
Rebecca is vice chair of the Senate Transportation Committee and also sits on the Labor, Commerce, and Tribal Affairs Committee and the Human Services, Reentry, and Rehabilitation Committee. Additionally, she is the co-chair of the Senate Members of Color Caucus and serves on the Social Equity and Cannabis Task Force and Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Theology and Humanities from Seattle University and lives in Rainier Beach with her husband and two youngest children. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Senator Saldana today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I have a feeling that um, Guillermo and David and I all kind of thought the other person is going to really dig into HEAL Act. Um, but I will try to have a few minutes, I think, for questions, and I'm happy to dig in more. And I think that what I do want to do is I, I gave my talk a really um, bold uh, title, and I want to um, claim right now that I may fall very short, um, but um, this last year since we passed, since the pandemic, and in 2021, at the end of that session, we um, did pass the HEAL Act, which does put environmental justice definition into statute, includes and covers seven agencies. And, um, and what it does is um, begin to um, try to make sure that we are, it's, a, it's basically a seed that we've planted. And um, I do think it is one of the most um, by and for the people living on the margins, on the borderlands. It, it is a transformative seed that we planted in the heart of our addicted dependence on polluting resource extraction to fuel our economy. And it is, you know, and that resource extraction, um, the tanglement of militarism, colonialism slash white supremacy and, um, and capitalism, you know, those are so entangled. Um, that has so long been our Babel, our, our Tower of Babel. And, the, and so much about is rooted in our humanity and our democracy uh, of how we are as a human species are living on this earth right now. And those three are very entangled. And I would say that as we are having our talks today and as we're looking at how we address climate impacts, how we look at um, the crisis of unhoused individuals and the crisis of addictions um, and all of that is entangled. Um, and I think and one of the things that I kind of want to start with is just um, cautioning all of us um, in two ways. One is technology um, is something that I think we think is somehow a different tool. Um, or somehow pure, but it is entangled with all those three things as well. And the other piece is that when we say by and for the people on the margins, as many of us um, come from those margins and those borderlands, and we try to um, find, or we find ourselves in positions of much more influence, we find ourselves in positions and leadership of institutions, um, democratic institutions, nonprofits that are community, um, are trying to be a community accountable, um, um, communally ac accountable to our communities and to the earth. And especially all of us here that are um, so lucky to call Coast Salish lands, the Pacific Northwest, our home. We um, like to call ourselves social justice environmentalists. And it's easy on this Earth Day uh, to, to point at those that are not doing so well. But you know what I uh, have seen is that so many more of those fingers are pointing back um, at, at ourselves. And that is where my container of grief comes in, is to recognize that all those things that I'm trying to undo um, and to change, um, there's 
it is in response to these addictions, um, both personal familial addictions, um, but also um, to the addictions that I spoke to earlier that are much more structural, um, that are about extractive energies. And, and my container really went through a lot this last year, um, dealing with grief. And I think that um, as an empathetic person um, that was raised um, in this Catholic traditions and the traditions of liberation um, and traditions of pacifism and um, sim attempting to live a more simple life traditions. What um, I uncovered is that my, I, I have adapted in a way that is not honoring um, the energy that is in our own body. And what has been spoken to earlier today in a couple of ways is um, our connection as incarnate people. Um, to this mother earth and in truly valuing our life and the gift of this breath. And so in this moment, I want you in your square that I don't get to, that I don't get to see in this format to ground yourself. Touch something that is alive. And if you don't have a plant nearby or you're not outside, touch here, your heart space. And I like for us all to take a breath. And to take another breath. because this is our daily bread. We must, we can't control everything outside. You know? We can't control what we put on paper, how it, be, how it becomes um, law and how it gets implemented. But we can control our energy and our spirit in our own bodies and we can honor it. Dolores Huerta says, everybody has power. And it compelled her to leave teaching and become a lifelong organizer, to support and accompany farm workers in claiming and, and seeing their own power and bringing their power towards collective action. Today, I have arrived at the age of 45 years young. And I find myself so different and yet so much the same uh, place of where I was as a student at Seattle, Seattle University. I admit now that, uh, you know, I, as a young person um, uh, applying to colleges, I um, remember writing one an essay and, and uh, learning about Aloha Inn, which is a housing um, apartment complex that was run by Catholic Housing, but was governed by the tenants. And part of their rent would go towards their first and last um, so that they could accrue um, some wealth that allowed them for more choice um, once they left that program to go find an apartment of their own. And my, my liberal arts humanities capstone focused on the homelessness of migrant and resident agricultural workers living along the Columbia River, picking our apples and our cherries. And I had the opportunity to, to meet and interview Representative Kenny, um, to engage with Senator Murray's office and the United Farm Workers and the Brewers League, even attended our SU presentation. And we were able to connect that into the world of bringing SU students to the state capitol. It was my first time on the steps of the capitol. 
and we advocated for the creation and the funding for the Farm Worker Housing Trust Fund. I studied theology and ran the campus ministry community services, volunteer work, and our speaker series. And I say that, I often say that led me to become a union organizer with the farm workers and to really continue a lifelong journey at intersectional transformation, transformational justice. You know, on this Earth Day, President Biden is visiting Seward Park to speak up for old growth. While at the same time, the federal court has ordered the Department of Interior to resume leasing of federal lands for gas and oil. I have 99 Douglas fir saplings sitting in my driveway that our 4-H Emerald City Changemakers Club potted together a couple weekends ago, thanks to our neighbor, Miss Yvette Dinesh, who connected us with Grow It Forward, which is a new group of gardeners who have come together during the pandemic to start micro nurseries of native plants for restoration. You know, this Earth Day week, my kids and I started watching a new Netflix show, The World's Most Extraordinary Houses. And we were blown away with the mimicry and building along natural landscapes and with reclaimed materials for weekend homes for wealthy business people. And of course, being my kids, you know, they're slightly ruined. They can't watch a show like that and not kind of blurt out in their earnest, sarcastic tone. Ooh, I wonder why homelessness exists when this person has their fifth home where they're only living there on weekends or summers. And that's why for me, the work that we're about must always be constantly attention and holding that right tension. So, you know, as I prepared for this, um, this talk, I did a few things. I, um, I reread a speech I gave at Climate Solutions Breakfast in 2019 and some of my early notes and journals. I had the opportunity to listen to a loud racket of melodies of mockingbirds in Fresno, California, which is the heart of agriculture in California, it, it, the heart of agriculture, period. I looked and touched the bark of trees from scaly brown black oak to the fleshy, soft, deep reds of sequoia groves living and dying in Yosemite National Park. And I repotted house plants, cut and trimmed, added more soil, detangled roots as best as I could and separated what I could without killing them and then putting them into new and old pots. And it's that last piece that I think most resonates to me um, right now is that how much time I had to spend untangling the sinews and roots. And my mind would go to the idea of detangling thread and yarn and the care at time, we, and how much care and time we spend in following threads and roots, determining how much we can salvage and support to make beautiful tapestries that turn into resilient groves and soils that creates the kind of interdependent loving communities that we all so much hunger for. And how much must be cut and tossed or given up as impossible knots of, or become weeds and invasive and root bound so much that it chokes out all that could be. And that's kind of where we are right now with the HEAL Act, with how we change things while also being in relationship with so much that is not perfect. Um, and that is so the built up environment and the fuels that we currently all um, continue to stay addicted to and are trying so desperately to find healthy alternatives to. And that's where the seed that is a transformative seed is being planted, but it requires each one of us to do our part to make sure that in our own ways, we are trying to both be accountable to and center the lives and the voices and the experiences of those of Mother Earth and of the people who have been most harmed as we're trying to 
salvage these institutions and these containers as imperfect as they are, um, but that have a purpose if we can put them into the right service. I want to end this um, sharing a poem from Gloria Ansaldúa. And I have been debating whether to do it in English or Spanish um, because I know that I probably don't have time to do both. So I'm gonna read it in Spanish because you can go look it up in English. And I think it um, says, has a great rhythm in the Spanish. It's her poem, A Sea of Cabbages. And it's dedicated for those who have worked in the fields. Encando, encando, manos hinchadas, sudor floreciendo en su cara, su mirada en altas veredas, sus pensamientos torciendo corredas, para pescar ese palomo de las alturas, siglo tras siglo nadando. Brazos atríticos dando vueltas y vueltas y vueltas recorriendo surcos. Un gusano en un mar verde. Una vida estremecida por el viento. Meciéndose en una goma de esperanza. Atrapada en las redes con la paloma. A mediodía en la orilla de las verdes col colmenas. En la, la en la labor de un ranchito en Texas. Saca sus tortillas con chile, toma agua, echa caldo por el sol. A veces maldice su suerte, la tierra, el sol. Sus ojos inquietos, pájaros volando sobre veredas altas en busca de esa paloma blanca y su nido. Hombre en verde mar, su herencia, manos gordas manchadas echando raíces en la tierra. Aunque empenado, bebía cara arriba, en sus ojos telarañas. Pescaban las plumas blancas. Sus manos rompen repollos de sus nidos. Rompen venudas, hojas cubriendo, hojas tiernitas, cubriendo hojas más pálidos, pálidas el corazón. Siglo tras siglo, levantando, desjoándose en un mar de repollos. Mareado, cuerpo sostiendo el azote del sol. En sus manos los repollos se contercen como peces, espesa lengua, tragando la amarga escoria. El sol pesada, piedra sobre su espalda, quebrándose. La tierra se estremece y le pega en la cara. Espuma brota en sus labios, se derrama, ojos abiertos, cara arriba, buscando, buscando. Los blancos de sus ojos se congelan. Hoy el viento barriendo los pedazos quebrados y luego el ruido de plumas dulce en su garganta. No escapa de su trampa, su fe, paloma hecha carne. May you value and know that you are loved, that your energy is in your body, and that your body has power, that when we come together, we can clear space for that seed to take root, our seeds to take root, and for those roots to tangle in a way that complements, that gives strength and allows us to grow a future worthy of our children, and our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Saldana. That was beautiful. Um, a really amazing poem. Uh, thank you for sharing that. As we head into um, the next 10 minutes, I'm hoping that folks who are joining us today can use the Q&A feature to submit any questions um, for you to answer. Um, so I'll wait one minute to see if anyone sends something in. Otherwise, we can get started with one of the questions I've already received. Um, this first question, is comes from one of our Seattle University community members, 
what are your thoughts on the topic of a carbon tax? And would that help Washington reduce our emissions and address the climate crisis? Great. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that um, what we have right now um, is a Climate Commitment Act, which is a price on carbon that um, is already there. So I do think it'd be challenging to do both in, in the same economy or in the same state at the same time, but I don't, maybe there is a way for that forward. But I think what we have right now is the Climate Commitment Act, which is set to create $16 billion um, would, or a little bit more than that, but you know that we have going towards transportation to decarbonize on that side. The other piece is that there's still many other ways that we can regulate or we can demand performance. Um, there is a bigger conversation I think that we need to have in general around our upside down tax system in Washington state and what we need to do to be able to make sure that we have the right kind of resources um, so that the state can be a better partner for Washingtonians in general. So, um, so I think it'd be it'd be difficult, but it you know especially as we're thinking about other states and thinking about the the nation, like we need to be continuing to con to consider that. But those would be my initial response to that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, that is a great um, answer. Uh, I see we had a question um, for putting a reference to the poem in the chat. I see that that has already been done. Thank you. Um, one other question. So for folks who may be sitting in these Earth Talks today and really navigating, um, being excited about the future and the change that we can enact, I, I wonder what your advice might be uh, when navigating the complexity that is sort of climate advocacy work, you know, making sure that we are working um, towards a just and humane future while still caring for ourselves. Um, and I was wondering if you could give some words of advice to the members joining us today around navigating all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think one is to recognize that it's not all up to us and that, I mean, part of it is there are amazing people and obviously today is a great way to get exposed to that there's so many different ways that we can be making a difference in our in our sphere so knowing what your sphere is and then you know or where you want to be if your sphere is not there right now where do you make those connections right um so that you can have that i do think front and centered and some of the community-based organizations that are here in our communities that we're hearing about um you know, give us a way to enter in. And I think, you know, I'll just say like some of the things that I'm reading um, that give me it. So is making sure that you are taking breath, that you are being conscious of your own body and thinking about energy and how much are you using um, and what's that outcome that you're getting um, out of that energy. But um, for, my, for myself, I think it changes during the seasons of my life. But right now I have a, a daily reading practice that I do um, that includes chanting, includes reading from the Sesh book, which comes out of um, Naranon um, and reading Borderlands again, um, which is Gloria and Saldua, um, which is where one of the way, places where that book poem was published. Um, but I'm also reading about, um, Black authors, and um, I was like, I was gonna find her book, but um, Progress Alliance is doing a um, reading soon on it, and it is right here. Uh, the the Whiteness of Wealth by Dorothy A. Brown. So I think you know those are a couple of things that I do. I think the similar in terms of others is like is to recognize that you can't um, you can't burn yourself out um, if if you know, we need you for sustained work. Uh, and, and so often um, as we're trying to change the, the structures that are around us um, is that if we aren't careful, by the time we get there, we have become um, too similar um, to be able to have the distance and the perspective. And, um, 
and you know, I believe in democracy, little d democracy, which requires us to, to continue to find meaning for all the people. Um, we can move them out, but we, you know, of uh, maybe being in that power and having so much influence, but we need to continue to keep people in our community. Um, and so that's my, you know, where I come from. Um, and hopefully it is something from that is helpful to others. Thank you so much. I know that we have to wrap up on time here for the first half of the session. Again, I wanna thank you for coming and being a keynote speaker today. Um, and I will pass it off to Dr. Thompson. All right, Kirsten, thanks so much, Senator Saldana, for joining us today with your inspirational presentation. Really appreciate your time. America, thanks for moderating the Q&A. And, and I wanna thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations. We're gonna take a 90 minute break and we're going to be back with another slate of presentations. And so uh, we'll see you back here at two o'clock. If not before, you can enjoy some music from, uh, from some of our guests. All right, we'll see you soon. Uh, one of the things that's important for uh, us in our sharing is that in the Center for Social Transformation and Leadership at the College of Education, we believe that we should be enacting our students to apply what they're learning um, to the community, whether that be in leadership development, whether that be for environmental justice, environmental studies um, in business. And the part of the reason why we are supporting the national um, organ NCLS was we really want to put education forward to change the world. And so in our conversations about SDGs and informing our community about that, we in the College of Education really believe it's important that we inform everybody, no matter what field, um, about how they can make impact um, and apply to these. So if you look at the 17, whether you're in the College of Education, whether you're in business, uh, you can change the world as it relates to the SDGs. So in our work, and the Center for Social Transformation and Leadership, we are going to continue to offer at least twice a year some type of event to educate those about how they can become active transformational leaders uh, around these SDG goals. And it's our hope that you will join us, um, as well as uh, NCLS and S NSLS um, in those activities that they're moving forward, such as the event that they're having on Monday uh, related to food sustainability. So Audrey, do you want to take a moment to talk about that? Yes, I will. Um, so going, going off of what Dr. T said, we our chapter is trying to do more work around the SDGs. So we have been putting on events that we like to call SDG focus events. Um, we put on one focus event uh, surrounding goal number five, gender equality in January. And we were joined by the Real Escape from the Sex Trade and Dr. Mary Robertson, which some of you might know. Um, and then we held another SDG focus event on addressing homelessness um, with DESC. And they talked a little bit about their work that they're doing. And yes, we're very excited for Monday. Um, we are having another SDG focus event on food security and sustainable agriculture. Um, so that's kind of zeroing in on goal number two, zero hunger. Uh, and that event will be from 4 to 5 p.m. on Zoom. And if you'd like to attend, uh, we would love to see you there. Please just visit our Connect SU page for more information. Um, you can find that by looking up NSLS or the National Society of Leadership and Success. Um, that should pop right up for you. And then if anyone would like to collaborate on events in the future, we're very open and we want this uh, to be a very collaborative experience for everyone. So please feel free to reach out and I will pass it to Dr. T. And the last thing I would say is with the Center for Social Transformation and Leadership, we are so excited about our continued partnerships with the Center for um, Environmental Justice. And we would also invite anybody to partner with us or ask for our involvement um, as we look toward educating those around SDGs um, in the future and how they could activate their leadership uh, to make a difference in the world. So you could also just uh, pop in um, uh, CSTL um, in our listserv and look at, at the center website or also just contact me directly at my email that is sitting here on the uh, PowerPoint. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you and happy Earth Day, everyone. Thanks, Audrey and Dr. T.
Um, let me start sharing my screen. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Okay, sweet. Um, my name's Donna, and I'm with my co-panelist, Rachel. And um, today we're going to be talking about the um, impacts of fast fashion and legal solutions to fast fashion. So to start, um, just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm a first year law student and I'm a graduate of Creighton University, a fellow Jesuit university that um, has also fully committed a full divestment from fossil fuels, which is kind of where my sustainability journey started. Um, and Seattle U is or the, one of the reasons I chose Seattle U is because of how great the sustainability is here um, and the drive and the passion of the students. And um, then tying that into like environmental law and policy, um, that's kind of what drove me to hosting this Earth Talk with Rachel. And hi, I am Rachel Woodard Kelly. Um, I'm also a first year law student uh, along with Donna. Um, what drove me to sustainability is um, my background in the sciences. Um, my background is in biochemistry and I had the privilege to teach high school biology for three years and work with a bunch of former ecologists. And they taught me so much and they especially taught me the importance of treating our planet well. And so that is why I'm here with y'all today. Awesome. So um, some inspiration behind our Earth Talk is kind of like the um, idea that like clothing and textiles serve as an indicator of wealth and social status. Um, and that's something I've personally noticed through my experience in law school of like looking the part and realizing like that's um, not very affordable. So then there's this drive towards cheap and fast fashion. And then also this like subconsciousness um, understanding of the impacts on the environment. And so um, then we are also like taking a lot of classes that are showing us that there can be a lot of positive legal implications that can um, like turn bad into good basically. So that's kind of where we got this idea from um, and wanted to see how we can navigate using the law to minimize our carbon footprint. Um, and then just some companies that are big names that you might recognize um, will be kind of the forefront of our topic today. Um, So what is fast fashion? Um, fast fashion is just like the idea that um, it's quick, cheap, and like not sustainable, like in the sense that it doesn't last long, as well as the fact that it's very bad for the environment. Um, fashion is one of the most polluting industries. And um, something that I thought was really frightening as a fact was that um, the fashion industry has produced an estimate of 1.2 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions um, as of 2015, which is more than the carbon footprint of international flights and maritime maritime shipping combined. Um, and um, I believe that like each individual in America produces 80 pounds of waste annually. And so just thinking about like, sometimes we put a big um, burden on like companies, which as we should, but there's also this individualized understanding that we all are a part of the problem too. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about how to combat that in our talk with you guys today. Um, and then also just the adverse effects of fast fashion that we may not see it here like in our backyards every single day, but knowing that um, our fellow um, humans that are like not a part of the problem necessarily are suffering the most from it with these adverse effects. And then also just keeping in mind what environmental justice is, um, something that SU prides itself on is the fair, and tr fair treatment and meaningful involvement of everyone um, with respect to the development and implementation of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, and this is a photo from an article that was posted about fast fashion um, in Ghana. And um, I, I actually had a doctor's appointment last week and my nurse was from Ghana and I asked her like, is this what the, me this is what the media is portraying, is this accurate? Like, I feel like we see things all the time and we never know like what exactly it looks like. And she was like, that doesn't even give it justice. It's much worse than that. Unfortunately, like we are cleaning up the beaches every single day and people are just like getting all of these clothes off the beach and reselling them and it's their way of income. And um, it's just polluting our entire community. And so that was really like an eye-opening experience to meet someone who's, this is literally their backyard. Um, 
And now I'm gonna pass on to Rachel. Awesome. Uh, so now that we've talked about what fast fashion is and why it's a problem, we're going to talk about the laws and policies that enable fast fashion. Now, I recognize that most, if not all of you are not legal scholars, or scholars, no worries. We're gonna keep this nice and high level and we're just gonna give you like the most important takeaways that you should know about. So the fast fashion industry is impacted by many, many areas of the law. We're gonna talk about just a select few, but just know it is more complex than we are betraying. Uh, so for just uh, some of the four, some of the many areas that of the law that impact fast fashion include intellectual property, uh, labor and employment laws, e-commerce laws, and regulations. Intellectual property, if you don't know, that just contains things like patents, uh, trademarks. So if you are a company, a fast fashion company or any company, and you want a logo, you're going to get that solidified using intellectual property laws. Labor and employment laws, those are just laws used to uh, make sure that employees are treated fairly, that work environments are safe. E-commerce laws have to do with what you can buy and sell online. And regulations are passed not by Congress, but by agencies uh, such as the EPA. And so those are four of the areas of the law that impact fast fashion. So we're going to start by focusing on uh, labor and employment laws. So many fast fashion companies actually avoid U.S. labor and employment laws by manufacturing products overseas. So a lot of times, if you look at your clothing, it'll say where it's made. Chances are it's made in China, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, or Mexico. If it says made in USA, great. Unfortunately, that is not the majority of the clothing that we see out there. Um, and these companies, I mean, excuse me, not companies, these countries have uh, labor employment laws that are more lax than the US is. So that is, a, that is an appealing factor to uh, these fashion companies. Fashion companies also have to deal with a wide range of regulations. Uh, just a few, for example, uh, there are regulations that control uh, the uh, environmental marketing claims companies can put out. There are regulations controlling uh, the, uh, whether a, fa a fashion company can say whether that has wool, whether it has like real fur. So there are aspects of our law that are meant to control those things. Now, all the laws and regulations I just talked about are on the federal level. Where we can really make an, a more immediate impact is when it comes to state uh, consumer protection laws and regulations. And so this is where local advocacy can really make a difference because oftentimes we can make these state and local laws and regulations stricter than we're able to make them on the federal level. Um, but I guess just to wrap it up, there's um, a New York, um, New York legislation out right now that's implementing a lot of regulations on big companies. So you can just Google that and figure it out and we can um, maybe like post it on the website or something. Um, but thank you guys for your time and sorry for going over. And it's just a really complex topic. So I highly encourage you guys to look more into it. Yep. If you take away local advocacy, you can do a lot. Thanks, Donna and Rachel. So our next group uh, is a group of civil engineering students who are going to talk about their senior design project. So Molly, Janelle, Kira, Kang, and Darwin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. T. OK. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our Earth Talk presentation today. We're going to discuss our senior civil engineering capstone project regarding off-grid temporary shelter communities. My name is Molly Elric, and I'm joined by Janelle Ho. And other members of our group that aren't in this discussion today include Kira Lemelin, uh, King Nguyen, and Darwin Fu. We will start by talking about our sponsor company, Palette, and then discuss more about the purpose of our project, which is broken up into two phases. Pallet is a social purpose company located in Everett, Washington. They were founded in 2016 and their mission is to serve the homelessness community by providing transportable shelter units that are cost effective and can be rapidly deployed. Pallet has also identified that their product can be utilized to act as temporary housing for individuals or families that have been displaced due to natural disasters. Rapid deployment would be vital in these situations. So by implementing off-grid technologies, the deployment as well as the deployment would be faster, as well as being cost effective because there would be no need for municipal water and power connections. Here's an example of a 64 square foot unit. As you can see, amenities such as air conditioning, heating, and power outlets are provided. Pallet also has 64, 100, 400, and 800 square foot units, as well as bathroom and laundry units. 
As mentioned, our project contains two phases. The first phase of the project focuses on optimizing communities for social well-being, while the second part of the project is focused on implement implementation of off-grid technologies. So phase one of our project is located in Chico, California. It's a fictitious site of 177 units. And our design procedure was to create a literature review to identify the best management practices and apply those BMPs to create designs optimized for social well-being. We scored our designs via a comparison matrix. This is one of our site layouts that we produce that incorporate the best management practices as discussed before. The conclusion of phase one brings us to phase two of our project, which again is located in Burlington, Washington. Um, as Molly stated earlier, the primary focus of phase two is to integrate off-grid technologies to reduce reliance on municipal infrastructure in a site we've designed based off of the best management practices we've learned in phase one. Um, for this particular phase, we've been working with UMC to design an off-grid potable and gray water conveyance system. And we have also been working with Silfab, uh, West Seattle Solar and Kilowatts for Humanity to design an off-grid PV array. To ha handle human waste, we are also working with Cedron to implement an incinerating toilet on site. Um, this is a bird's eye view of our site layout. And as you can see, we've implemented seven 64 square foot sleeping units, um, one 100 square foot ADA accessible unit, a 100 square foot two stall bathroom that will, is equipped with two showers, two sinks, and two toilets. We also have a 100 square foot laundry unit, a 64 square foot electrical shed that will house batteries for the solar array and a generator. Um, and finally, we have a 400 square foot utility shed that will house um, the incinerating toilet system and two systems cisterns, one for gray water and one for potable water. This is a quick drawing showing how the potable water system will be implemented. Um, a cistern that is filled up once a week by a water truck will provide all the fresh water for the community. Water in the cistern will be pumped into an expansion tank that will pressurize the water and send that pressurized water into the bathroom and laundry units. Um, subsequently, all the water used to wash hands and to take a shower and to wash clothes will be drained into a sump pump that will pump all of that dirty water into the gray water cistern, which will be trucked away once a week. Um, as previously mentioned, we are also working with Cedron to implement an incinerating toilet. This here um, is an image of a process flow diagram for that, that toilet. Um, the incinerating toilet looks and operates like a normal toilet that uses water to flush. However, once the toilet is flushed, the solids are incinerated and turned into ash while the liquid is evaporated and subsequently treated by an in-house uh, treatment system, um, which is then used to supply future flush water. And finally, to supply the community with electricity, we are also implementing a PV array. Um, we are still in the midst of designing the system, but so far we've estimated the energy demand of the community and the energy production of a 46 panel array, which will be placed on the tops of the units. Um, as you can see in this figure, the energy produced by our solar array will not meet the energy demand of the community in certain seasons. So we will be sizing a diesel generator to make up that difference um, between the electrical demand and the production. Um, to summarize, phase one of our project, again, is focused on designing pallet communities in a manner that promotes social well-being, um, while in phase two, we are implementing off-grid technologies like water conveyance system, um, an incinerating toilet, and a solar panel array so that future communities can be built without connecting to municipal infrastructure. Um, thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us. Great job, team. Our next speakers are Gabby Badenek and John Armstrong, Dr. John Armstrong, who will talk about city climate mitigation strategies and policy transitions. All right, thank you all for having us. Dr. Armstrong and I are excited to be here today to present on city climate mitigation strategies and policy transitions. To start off, I've been assisting Dr. Armstrong this past school year with research in local climate policy. This work has stemmed from a lack of action taken by the United States federal government on climate legislation, a trend that we see globally with weak commitments to climate change mitigation. Today, the United Nations, climate scientists, and policy experts alike highlight the importance of ambitious city climate policies in achieving greenhouse gas emissions goals, including those outlined in the Paris Agreement, and over a thousand local governments across the United States have taken some form of climate action among thousands globally, drawing praise as optimistic leaders that are working to fill climate action gaps left by inadequate national legislation. 
So what can cities do surrounding climate policy that federal governments lack? The American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, also known as ACE, identifies five main policy areas for cities to tackle climate action. These are transportation, buildings, energy and water, community-wide initiatives, and local government operations. These five areas gauge cities' progress towards greenhouse gas emissions reductions and energy efficiency while developing and delivering these changes equitably. We can see some examples of these city policy areas in action throughout the country. For example, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania adopted an electric vehicle strategic plan to promote a transition from gas powered vehicles, which involved the expansion of charging stations citywide. The city of Cleveland, Ohio enacted a green building standard policy to promote sustainable and efficient management of energy, water, waste, and more in all city buildings. Grand Rapids, Michigan passed a green infrastructure policy that established measurable goals of water quality and management throughout the city and Hartford, Connecticut adopted a tree canopy plan to decrease urban heat island effects, increase equitable tree canopy cover, and plant over a thousand trees throughout the town each year. And lastly, the city of Oakland, California implemented a clean energy efficient municipal fleet under a green fleet resolution to optimize energy use for city vehicles. So Dr. Armstrong. Thanks, Gabby. Um, the recognition of the need for cities to enact ambitious policies that Gabby talked about raises this critical question. How effective are most of the cities, most of the policies that cities have adopted? Despite the ones like Gabby just described that are making a lot of progress and all the praise that cities have gotten for taking climate action, a fair amount of recent research finds that many city government climate policies are really more symbolic than substantive, requiring minimal resources. Most governments have taken these kinds of modest actions, but we can think of as low-hanging fruit policies like efficient lighting or joining networks or setting far off goals that only minimally reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Only a relative few governments have enacted ambitious, really effective policies that lead to significant greenhouse gas emission reductions, like setting strict renewable energy and building efficiency standards. This dilemma presents a great challenge that is at the heart of our research project. Given that broad base of local governments that have taken some form of climate action, over a thousand in the United States, there's a great deal of opportunity for cities to have a very significant effect in reducing greenhouse gas emissions if they can make that transition to ambitious policy programs. So we're examining whether and how modest climate actions can be stepping stones to ambitious policies. Through a study of 30 cities across the United States who are getting started on now, the research has three core aims. First, to understand the role of modest actions in the adoption of ambitious policies. Second, to assess the socio-political conditions and factors underlying the decisions that policymakers make or may, may not make to make that kind of a policy transition. And then finally, to evaluate the common pathways in the evolution of city climate policies leading to those ambitious programs that kind of a pathway analysis that can help inform other cities that might be looking to do the same. So in summation, we believe the research will shed critical light on how cities can enact high impact ambitious policies to achieve greater progress on climate change and sustainability. With that, happy Earth Day everyone. Thank you very much. And we'll pass it to the next speakers. All right, thanks very much team. Excellent presentation. Our next presentation is going to be by Zach Smith, who is a member of the Engineers for a Sustainable World Student Club here at CLU. And so Zach, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, nice talks, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Smith. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm an environmental studies and public affairs double major. And I will be presenting on uh, what SU's chapter of Engineers for Sustainable World has been doing um, with our new rain garden that we're gonna put in on campus. Next one. Okay, so a little background on the club first. Uh, SU ESW is a part of an international ESW network that uh, works on engineering projects and sustainability solutions uh, with students and professionals. Uh, SU's chapter has had a long history of working on like 
uh, water quality things in um, other countries internationally, uh, helping establish clean water. We're currently building a tiny house um, pretty soon this quarter, which is very exciting. And our hydroponics team has been doing a ton of work, um, but mainly this week they uh, grew poplar trees uh, to sell, which is super cool. And we have much, much more going on in the club. Um, and moving to rain garden. So the rain garden, um, definition that we worked off of was uh, it's a design landscape that reduces water flow rate, total quantity, and pollutant load off a of runoff. Rain gardens have tons of benefits. Uh, they improve water quality, they encourage wildlife, they're uh, fun to look at, and uh, they can reduce pollution. So some of our goals as a club, uh, we wanted to get a hands-on project for students um, and engage them in the design process as well as um, introduce them to low impact development concepts. Um, we're hoping to promote environmental sustainability on our campus some more with including things such as wildlife supports of so plants for pollinators um, that fit in with the rest of campus. And we also want to hopefully measure the efficiency of the rain gardens with a long-term um, study project by using sensors um, that will be operated by the club and we hope to get experience with uh, professionals. Uh, in this case, it was landscape architects from the Berger Partnership uh, who helped us out throughout this process. Uh, this is the current site that we use. This is the Bellarmine um, turnaround, the flagpole lawn. If you know it or have walked past it, um, you've never really seen anyone walk through it because it's a risk. It is very muddy um, and gets stays pretty muddy um, during uh, rain events. So we wanted to, uh, we thought it was a great site um, for students, good size for a process like a rain garden. Um, and, and we think it'll look great. So um, in our design process, we used um, charrette groups, which meant that we had, we asked all types of majors. We welcomed everyone to come to our club and work on this, this project together. So we came up with a bunch of elements and some designs that um, brought forward a lot of our favorite things we wanted to see in the rain garden. Um, and these are some of them. And then the landscape architects took all of this and put it into our final design. This is our final design. Some of the things will be different um, when we actually build, but uh, this is generally how it will look. We, some of our favorite elements included a gravel path that is ADA accessible. Um, a gabion wall is my favorite part of it. I really want a gabion wall. Um, and then some, some terrace part of the garden and have a general uh, flow, kind of like a river going through it. So we can welcome people into the space much more. And so our next steps, um, we're currently awaiting a grant decision because we need money for this project. Um, we're gonna purchase and store plants this quarter. We're gonna design the plant layout. So another design process within the club um, doing that this quarter. And in fall, we're going to build. We need a ton of people to build. If you want to come out, um, I'll have information on the next slide for that. And then we're also going to celebrate. And we're going to begin monitoring, hopefully, um, for long term with those sensors. And so if you want to get involved, um, feel free to take a picture of this slide. There's a lot of information on it um, first, but email Barbara uh, B. McCaskey right there at CIU.edu. We meet every Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, you can get on that email list. Um, you can follow us um, at CLU underscore ESW on Instagram. Um, and then if you're thirsty after these talks, you can go to Drip Tea today before 9 p.m. and tell them that you're supporting the ESW uh, fundraiser. And we get some money, but also you get the chance to know that your money's going towards something very good for the world. Um, and also uh, if you would like to donate to our club, um, to not only support this rain garden project, but some of the other projects that we have going on. There's Joey's Venmo. Um, Joey is our treasurer. He's not just, just a random dude. Um, don't worry, that's not, that's not fake. Um, and then if you have any questions or, or want to talk more about this or see how you can get involved with the many projects that we got going on, there's my email right there, smithzachary at clu.edu. So that's my talk. Happy Earth Day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Zach. Really great job. I'm really proud of 
all the work that the ESW students are doing. You guys are doing some amazing stuff. So thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Poole from the biology department, who's going to talk to us about his water project. Thomas, it's all yours. All right. Great. Uh, thanks, everybody. And thanks to the other speakers. It's really interesting, really interesting talks and exciting talks. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the project that I've been involved in for the last couple of years, um, working with the Akiak Native community in southwest Alaska. And the goal of the project was really to develop a water harvesting system. And, uh, and that was to provide drinking water, household needs, ceremonial water, um, just numerous resources sort of at a, at a community uh, level. And that, that was really sparked by uh, concern, by leadership within that community and, um, and uh, just everyone that, uh, that we spoke to within the community that uh, was concerned about water security and in particular concerned about water security um, given climate change into the future. So there was concern about upstream um, development, but also just how are these resources going to change into the future. So I wanted to uh, present a little bit the, um, the sort of the process that we went through with this project. And, um, and I think that's interesting. Um, as a water project, but I think interesting more broadly as an aquatic ecologist, I've been involved in a lot of projects where we, we really rush to have measurable outcomes and, and products with regards to increased fisheries or, or um, more clean available water. But, um, but sometimes we rush through steps and uh, the group that I've been involved in with this project, they've really, I think, done a thoughtful job of how to make sure that um, Basically, they're designing a water cistern project, but they're really honoring tribal sovereignty and the wishes of the community um, that's, uh, that's been a part of this process. Um, and so I'm really focusing in on sort of steps one and two of our process, because I think, again, sort of the, the folks that have been driving this project have been really thoughtful and deliberate about um, how to have sort of a positive outcome with, uh, with this, the water project, but also a positive outcome sort of for all community members and, and partners in the project. And so, um, and it starts with the project genesis. And, and as an academic, we often sort of just to get funding, we, we sort of jump right past this and, and are going to outcomes and measurable products um, and pulling together teams. And, and what Dr. Clarita Lefhambegay and Chief Mike Williams Sr. Uh, did is they were partners in sort of another project and they just started talking and having some really good dialogue I think about concerns within the community. What did that community want? What were they worried about? Uh, what were they not worried about? And uh, started discussing that, um, and, and it became clear that um, through those discussions that water security was uh, a main concern. Um, and I think the interesting aspect is that as they went to sort of that next stage, they didn't sort of jump to solutions. They didn't sort of clearly articulate exactly what was going to happen next. They really started um, sort of forming that overall goal of having clean available water into the future um, and then figuring out like how can we bring in the community? How can we bring in um, other project team members that have different uh, expertise in different areas that can just become part of the conversation. Again, not really um, at this point even defining exactly what the solution needs to be or what the outcome of the project needs to be, but um, clearly defining some goals and making sure that um, everybody that wants to be included and heard is being heard. And, and for me, that was a uh, 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 part of the process that uh, is often, as I mentioned, uh, skipped. This is, was also happening all during COVID. Um, and there were only a couple places within the community that had consistent access to Wi-Fi. So this was extremely challenging. Um, and yet, uh, I think the community and all partners kind of stuck with it. And um, ultimately, it, it worked quite well. The latter part of the project, um, we continued sort of that constant partnership and in particular with the uh, co-design process, something that was new to me as well was sort of having weekly check-ins with community members, with partners, figuring out things like site selection, 
not just what would logistically make sense in terms of uh, the design itself, but uh, what's going to work for the community and where do they want this this water cistern and what are they really going to use uh, both now and sort of into the future. And then we ran into a slew of logistical challenges with the actual system, uh, uh, water harvesting system itself um, to sort of make it seasonal and and but we are now working on that the um, the water cistern is in place, but we are still working to get it fully operational and make sure that it's serving the community in the way that they uh, they want it. We had a lot of community partners and still do, um, which is really why the, the whole process worked. And um, if you want to learn a little bit more about the actual cistern itself and uh, how it's working now, uh, definitely touch base with me. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Poole. Our next speaker speakers will be uh, Kira Kruchenk and Emily Nielsen, two more students who are going to talk about hygiene justice at Seattle University. Team, it's all yours. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Emily and Kira is right over there. And we're going to be talking about hygiene justice at SU. We're both part of the club SSA, which is invested in this issue. Um, so to get us started, um, Move to the next slide. Uh, the US uses a lot of plastic. We know this. Um, 7.9 billion units of rigid plastic were created in 2018 alone to hold retail, beauty, and personal care products. Um, plastics are not only an issue impacting animals and ecosystems, they also contribute to an array of environmental justice issues. And where does this waste go? About 50% is landfilled or sent to other locations, and 13 percent is incinerated and these numbers are significant because 56 percent of landfills in the United States are purposefully zoned within two miles of low-income and minority neighborhoods and 79 percent of incinerators are purposefully zoned within three miles of low-income and minority neighborhoods. So these statistics illustrate how waste is not just an environmental justice issue, it's also an economic and racial justice issue. There we go. Um, the environmental justice implications of waste disposal, waste disposal go far beyond just the United States. It's estimated that roughly 2.2 billion people lack access to safely managed drinking water services and 4.2 billion people lack safely managed sanitation services. Uh, so what is hygiene justice? Hygiene justice ensures that everyone has access to affordable, sustainable, and healthy hygiene products. And so this issue is multifaceted, as we've already discussed. Uh, it's an economic justice issue in part because of accessibility to affordable products um, that are also healthy and sustainable. Uh, it's a gender justice issue because of the financial and physical access to period products, which is often restrictive. Um, it's a racial justice issue in part because of pollution and waste concentration within communities of color. And it is a disability justice issue because uh, access to scent-free and allergen-free products and things like that is very limited, especially in public spaces. And so these are just some examples of how complex hygiene justice is as a, an issue of justice. To get us situated with um, the overall context of this, we're gonna dive into some national statistics. About 20% of first gen college students reported experiencing being unable to afford period products within the past year. And this phenomenon is described as period poverty. In comparison, non-first gen students experienced period poverty half as much at 10%. In 2013, 34% of low-income families found it difficult to afford basic household necessities, including hygiene products in the past year. Notably, of these families, 82% live in households with low or very low food security. When money is super tight, people may cut back on necessary purchases. For instance, nearly 73% of low-income families reported cutting back on food in the past year so that they would be able to afford some household goods. Bringing this issue back to Seattle University and our campus community, we wanted to talk about some resources that already exist on campus. Um, there's the Gender Justice Center, which is a student group on campus located in Chardon 141. 
which has a take what you need, leave what you can period and hygiene product pantry that's accessible to anyone in the campus community. Um, and the OMA Center offers an OMA card, which provides financial assistance for one-time emergencies to students. Students also have access to the emergency Red Hawk dining cards, um, where students can access funds loaded onto dining cards to use at all on-campus dining facilities, meaning that they can also be used in the cave where students can buy hygiene products if they so choose to do so. And also this year, the Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability ran an initiative called Campus Cup, where they provided 360 free menstrual cups to students. By the way, students can still get a 20% discount using the code campus20 at allmatters.com. So take advantage of that um, at, uh, before the end of this school year. So these resources, having these resources on our campus is great, but we've identified some gaps in what these resources offer. Um, some of the gaps are limited eligibility in the application process to access these resources. Um, resources like the Red Hawk Dining Fund don't assist students who live on campus and have a required meal plan, have not exhausted financial aid eligibility, which includes grants and loans, um, or are unemployed but qualify for unemployment benefits. As well, uh, these resources don't address the systemic issue of hygiene inaccessibility because one-time and emergency-based initiatives don't address the continuous nature of inequitable access to hygiene products. They are only a temporary response. And the, also the high cost of living both in Seattle and on campus constrain affordability and access to hygiene products. For example, the high cost of food on campus can inhibit students' ability to also purchase necessary hygiene products that they could spend their meal plan on. Yeah, so moving forward, um, SSA wants to engage the community to imagine how we can best exemplify hygiene justice on campus. Uh, so visit us on May 12th in C Street to share your thoughts and to pick up free samples of plastic-free laundry detergent sheets, courtesy of the company Generation Conscious. Um, and again, mark your calendars for May 12th. We'll be in C Street from 1230 to 2 with educational resources, free samples, and open ears. And we can go to the next slide. Oh, Kira might be present. Yeah, so to contact us, please give us an email. Um, and follow us on Instagram at CLU underscore SSA for more information about this campaign and others that we're working on. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kara and Emily. Really great job. Emily, I can't believe you're graduating. It's crazy. Time flies. So our next speaker is Dr. Larry Frank, who is going to talk to us about the path of achieving justice. So I'm going to talk uh, uh, quickly about health equity, environmental impacts of community design. I'm really excited to be included in this discussion. Uh, I went to University of Washington, did my master's and PhD there. So I spent a lot of time in Seattle and uh, I've been researching for quite some time, uh, the relationships between the built natural environment and, and, and health and equity. Um, so, uh, 15, uh, in 2015, like seven, seven years ago already, the Surgeon General had a call to action. Uh, this was, uh, I think, towards the end of Obama's administration, uh, initiated Step It Up. There had been enough evidence accumulated by that time that uh, neighborhood design, walkability, and other factors such as green space had measurable effects on health, and that we better do something about it. Um, so I have to move fast. So this is a way to communicate the linkages and the type of research I do, which is large primary data collection in part, uh, major uh, clinical or observational studies, often funded by National Institutes for Health, where we track and characterize and measure the differences in people's health characteristics based on where they live. Uh, so transportation investments, land use, pedestrian environment features, and green space are all independent policy decisions made by different levels of government that affect our behaviors, how active we are, if we travel on foot or by car, if we interact or are able to interact with others along the way and our exposures to air pollution, traffic, safety and crime and noise. And those things then get a result in a biological response such as body weight, inflammation and stress that through space and time uh, add up and cause uh, chronic disease or, or, or prevention or uh, um, lower or greater likelihood of physical and mental health impacts, often in the form of chronic disease, it actually then 
I have another chart or another diagram like this that adds on uh, whether or not you have an existing condition affects uh, the severity of COVID if you're exposed or infectious disease and if you survive it. Um, and then we monetize all these uh, impacts. So basically the story here is that what we do in our behaviors in terms of, uh, of where we go and how we get around and our exposures are a function of where we live and where we work. So background about me is that in 1988, I started really with the first study uh, to, uh, this was in Seattle, uh, third of the century, uh, linking uh, walkability and natural environments with travel, health, and climate change, um, ended up really coining the term, perhaps along with others at the time, it sort of named itself. We actually had reached a time where we had the inability to walk. My work was um, published in the Seattle Times. I was funded by King County. We had a study called Healthscape, uh, led to walk score, redid walk score again uh, in 2012, making it a network-based tool. Um, that was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, published that this year, but the research behind walk score, we did a lot of twice. Um, and then we now build the smart location database and calculators for the US federal government, EPA, and the General Services Administration. That's the national coverage of walkability built in natural environment metrics for the whole country at the census block group level. Uh, we build a national public health assessment model, which is a software tool now that predicts health and related economic impacts of transportation and land use. And uh, now we're also creating, going to roll out uh, the National Environment Measures Database for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, which is basically what they use through their culture of health, health to predict um, walkability. Um, so transportation investments, where we invest and what mode we invest in results in where development can go and does go in the form it takes. That affects travel behavior, health, and cost, as was shown by 2010 when we wrote the hidden health cost of transportation uh, for the uh, American Public Health Association that was already kind of you know, known stuff by then. There's three geographies or scales at which um, neighborhood design affects our behavior. Regional accessibility, that's transit. Uh, Seattle has been investing heavily uh, and it's amazing to see all the different infrastructure coming online, uh, walkable, complete communities having live, work, play. The area around Seattle University is amazing. I actually have a home right there and I'm very excited to spend more time there in the future. And then the pedestrian environment, all the design features, the seating, the lighting, the trees, the eyes on the street, those things all affect behavior. Um, how we measure behavior has evolved over time from on the left from a fixed uh, polygon using census data, which was the best we could do when I did my dissertation some third of a century ago, we've now made it very precise. So this would be a home, this little pentagon shape, and these are train stations. And within 15 minutes, you can see what a person in this location can get to. If they have to get on the train and get off, they can get a little bit of that station area and a little bit less of the one further away. What we do, we have a daily activity space, home, work, and play. We pick up food and we do our activities along the way. So that is part of our behavior uh, environment. So where matters, and this is, uh, I was um, uh, a professor for 18 years um, at the University of British Columbia, uh, where I had the Bombardier Chair in Sustainable Transportation. I recently, a year ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, moved to the University of California at San Diego. Um, and this just shows kind of a, a, a transect, a, an Andreas Duani, uh, a, a very famous urban design architect and planner, uh, sort of from the most car dependent to the most walkable, we characterize people's behaviors and measure them in relation to the places where they live, as I've mentioned. This just shows you kind of examples or a typology of different place types. We can take those same place types, which is embedded behind this diagram, and compare to those in the most car dependent environments, those in moderately walkable or in the most walkable environments were 27 and 39% less likely to have diabetes. This is from the Seattle-based, uh, uh, Vancouver-based study that we're doing right now. Um, there's also, uh, you know, I could show the same thing for physical activity, uh, obesity, hypertension, uh, heart disease, uh, similar pattern relationships. But on the mental health side, which I think is very interesting and related to the equity and social justice, is being in a more compact and walkable environment has been found to be associated with more uh, a sense of community uh, and the, in the most moderate and, and moderately and, and walkable areas. So walkable and for whom? 
So walkability does not uh, translate into the same uh, impacts across uh, demographic subgroups. Wealthier people have green space, shops, entertainment, and other destinations. And the more poor instead don't get those benefits, but they get air pollution, noise, crime, and injury risk. So health outcomes differ as a result. It's a social justice issue, a serious one, because the poor are being displaced from the more walkable to the less. That's a huge issue, um, and we're studying that now. And that has led to really, and I have a lot of data all over the country, so I picked Seattle to show you, concentrated populations. Uh, we can see people of color on the left and low income on the right, which follows a similar pattern in terms of lack of tree canopy. Uh, the wealthy are getting much higher percentage of tree canopy and coverage. Uh, noise exposure um, is correlated again in the same pattern uh, with more um, exposure to noise for the less fortunate. Same with uh, injury risk uh, and proximity to freight facilities. These things all stack up. So we are creating an equity-based walkability measure, a composite measure, tree canopy, and all the things I just mentioned. And we can then relate that back to people's health. Those living in the USA's block groups with the worst environmental exposure, you can see 15%, uh, more than double uh, those people of color compared to whites, uh, and 12%, uh, nearly 1.5 times as high compared to those that are higher income. So we see these relationships. To do something about it, and wrapping up, we build a software tool. I say we, there's two we's associated with me, uh, University of California at San Diego, and then my consulting company, Urban Design for Health, which I founded over a quarter of a century ago, uh, which is funded to do a lot of things. Uh, and here has developed uh, the nationally applicable uh, National Public Health Assessment Model, which empowers communities, planners, and public health officials to quantify localized health impacts of alternative investment scenarios and supports current conditions and future forecasting allows for local environmental data integration. This is where the tools uh, been applied so far with several other uh, um, case studies coming online. Uh, different examples in LA, Houston, Rochester, New York, Las Vegas, Chicago, where we're able to dial right into the parcel level, uh, the fabric of the urban environment, and test changes to those areas uh, and evaluate the health impacts uh, where we have social and cultural metrics, the physical and natural environment gets loaded in. We run statistical models and estimate and summarize results that predict a range of outcomes. Going fairly quickly, my last slide, this is an example of uh, Chicago, where we have baseline characteristics. Again, I'm showing diabetes as one example, and I can talk more. So in the, in the end, um, all of these effects on health and workforce productivity have a huge impact on our economy. Um, and this just shows an $8.41 payback is what we learned by estimating the health and economic benefits of investing in active transportation infrastructure in Los Angeles, that they have the $13 billion set aside for these investments. And we were able to uh, develop a, 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 a tool or a way to evaluate the, the benefits of that. So I thank you so much and uh, um, look forward to any comments uh, and feedback and enjoyed listening to your talks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Frank. Amazing presentation, lots of great information. And we're gonna have to have you back for, for more, uh, for more. So, so now um, I'd like to introduce Marrakesh Maxwell, who is the student body president here at Seattle University, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Marrakesh. Thanks so much again. Um, it is my privilege and honor again in the second half of these Earth Talks today to introduce our second keynote speaker. David Mendoza is the Director of Advocacy and Engagement for the Washington Chapter of the National Conservancy, overseeing state and federal lobbying and policy communication staff. While representing Front and Centered, a statewide coalition of communities of color, David led the, the development of the now enacted HEAL Act, Washington State's foundational environmental justice law. He also served as a co-chair of the State Environmental Justice Task Force and has been recently appointed by Governor Inslee to the Environmental Justice Council. He is a graduate of Pitzer College and the Seattle University Law School and is a licensed attorney in California. It is our pleasure to welcome you to Seattle U Earth Talks, and I will now hand it over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, very happy to be here tonight to end uh, this, this evening or afternoon to help uh, end this really innovative day of conversations and ideas that presented 
um, all afternoon. So again, I'm David Mendoza. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement, currently the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at the Nature Conservancy. That means I manage our uh, state and federal government relations team. There's government relations director in each of those areas, as well as a policy communications, and I manage that team and effort for our Washington State chapter. So the nation, the not, I'm sorry, the Nature Conservancy is, um, you know, quite literally the world's largest nonprofit. We operate in 76 countries uh, across the world. We manage or own two million acres of natural reserves, um, you preserving for the ecological benefits of different um, forests or, um, you know, other kinds of plains uh, as for their kind of natural uh, uh, plant life benefits, but also to preserve species. In Washington, uh, we were, we were divided into about 38 chapters in the United States. And, you know, in Washington, we own and manage 100,000 acres. So <clears throat> I've kind of divided my, my talk today in a couple of different ways. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, this concept that I wrote in my kind of cheekingly uh, accidental environment, environmentalist. And I chose that title very purposefully as, as, as I'm talking to a, you know, collection of students, undergrad and graduates who are pondering your own careers um, and how, you know, in hindsight, some of it makes sense to me, but a lot of it as you go through it is haphazard. And, and I have some maybe some pieces of advice you can take or leave as you see fit. But my intention in going to law school was not to become an environmental advocate. It was actually to instead work more on economic justice issues. I had worked in a homeless services agency for a couple of years, really enjoyed it. This organization really helped people rebuild their lives. You know, we had a range of services for men, women, families. Uh, but if anyone stayed and used our services, stayed with us for about three months, 70% of those folks never came back for services. But what I continued to see as I managed volunteers, which was my role there, was, you know, a number of similar reasons of why, especially women and women of color, were in our, were needing our services because they were homeless. And it usually had a, a similar story of they were working in retail or food service. They didn't have paid sick days. They or their kids got sick. They took that time off work and they couldn't pay their rent at the end of the month. And then they were illegally evicted. And then in our streets, and this was in California. And so I, I decided I wanted to go to law school uh, in order to kind of address the root causes of those problems instead of, you know, just the social services, needed services. But for me personally, I wanted to work on the kind of systemic wide issues. And so I did that. And I did that uh, with that very, very specific attention of economic justice, you know, pay, pay, pay fair labor standards, that, that sort of thing. Um, but what I ended up trying to do in my approach to kind of law school, and I went to, I chose Seattle U because of its social justice mission, was, I, you know, one of my uh, pieces of advice, I guess, would say is take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves to you. My experience was, you know, I, I was a fortunate to get a scholarship at the Latino Bar, Bar Association my first year. I was sat next, I sat next to a Seattle City Council member, and I was able to turn that into an internship that first summer. Similarly, that next year in law school, I had a professor uh, an international development class who offered to find international internships. Um, I was, and I got one and I was able to go to Bolivia thanks to a public interest law foundation group. And then after law school and I was back in Seattle, I went back to LA, but I came back to Seattle for work and being a little lost in a new city now kind of divorced from a school. Um, I, I took some advice from a friend from law school and applied for this organization. I encourage folks to look this up, the Institute for Democratic Future. It's a six month fellowship to learn about policy and politics in Washington. We like to say it's for hacks and wonks. Hacks are those campaign oriented folks and wonks are the policy oriented. And you learn about Washington state. And it's a fellowship that led not just to a new job, eventually my first job in, in state government, but also where I got to know my wife. Um, is that we didn't meet quite there, but we got to know each other. And I think without that program, I wouldn't you know, have, have the wonderful life I have today in many ways. Also, I'd like to keep, have folks to keep in mind, your career starts here in law school, your current classmates, maybe your future colleagues and allies. For me, that meant in my own law school class, there's me working at the Nature Conservancy. One of my study buddies is now legislative director for the Department of Natural Resources. And another former classmate is the legislative director for the Washington Environmental Council, one of our most trusted organizational allies that I work with. Um, but after graduating law school, my first job was at a economic justice, um, but also an environmental justice organization called LA Alliance for a New Economy. And you know, I'll take this moment to start switching to my screen share a little bit. 
Um, and so, um, sorry, as you do tech, it's hard to keep talking. Um, one of my first experiences there, and something that has been a profound and lasting impact on me is it, I, I went as part of this process, this organization works very closely with a range of labor unions, especially a uh, union called Unite Here, which works in hotels. And they, they have in their in their contract ability to take workers out of the work spot and train them for three days as or community organizers or worker organizers. And I went as part of my training as a policy analyst for this organization, I, um, I went through that training. And what I learned there is that you need to listen to the most impacted. They know exactly what they need to do to improve their own lives. And you need to also empower people to advocate for themselves. Community organizing, I think, is one of the most critical and most undervalued aspects of successful advocacy campaigns. There's no dearth of good ideas and policy solutions. The ones that are managed to get through the legislative process are the ones that are able to build a groundswell of public support in order to push those through and overcome those kinds of political barriers. And I think that's critically, cannot be done without successful community organizing. So if you, you find your path leads you down policy advocacy, I think a couple of things I, I would recommend is like you should be focused on seeking solutions that make specific needed change. And that that change, and not just a specific change, but that the change happens to the institutions themselves that have contributed inequality. And I'll give the example of the HEAL Act for that. Um, and, you know, also like compromise is not failure. When you work, you, you know, as you develop a policy, you inevitably encounter opposition and will have to adjust from your original idea. But as you acknowledge or accept those changes, I would say check with your own values. And I actually encourage if folks who were able to see Senator Saldana's, her, her, her uh, speech was right on about staying true to yourself and your energy, but also check in with your trusted partners, allies to check in and just have these questions. Does, the, does this move the issue forward and does this improve people's lives without harming them? And so, you know, before I wrap up this part, I have last three like, quick last pieces of advice for folks as you as you try to find and maybe survive in movement advocacy. Don't be hyper focused on a specific issue that you want to work on. Instead, focus on what you like to do every day. What is it that you know you enjoy about work in general? Are you do you like talking to people and trying to get them to support your work? Maybe you're a community organizer or, or a fundraiser. Maybe you just you know like many law students like being behind that desk and doing research. Maybe you're a policy analyst. So think about your career search in that way versus I need to work in this one kind of issue itself. As as my own experience has taught me that, and. Something that's hard, and I, I, don't, I say this especially for uh, for students of color, as you start working in these large institutions, that you are not your, the institution you work for, you know. But unfortunately, some folks will hold you personally accountable for all its faults. And so, you know, I had a lot of experience on this, both as you know, a lawyer and a lobbyist, probably two of the most hated uh, <laughs> professions in the world, but also working for government and how government has really harmed so many communities across the way. You know, it's how understand why you're there, what you're trying to do in those organizations, and, and, and keep keep that into in heart as you receive what can be really harsh criticism sometimes. Um, it's not an easy thing to have navigate, and it will keep you up at night, but you can also see the, the value that your work has over time, and you, you need to keep that in, in mind as you move forward. Um, I've had on the screen a little bit of my accomplishments uh, that I've been able to very fortunate part of these very significant legislative wins at the local level. I really have a strong uh, focus at local and state legislative advocacy because I feel that's where we can really effectively implement progressive change in our state and city. And so that's that's been a large focus of my work. I'm really not going to touch about most of those, just kind of wanted to show you the breadth of the kind of work I've done. We're going to dive into what's been really exciting. I'm really happy to end your, your day here talking about the exciting policy we've been able to pass here in Washington State. And also just start, start a little with what environmental justice is. And environmental justice is a process of inclusion, of inclusion to ensure we're hearing directly from communities impacted by by you know the decisions of placing factories or waste <laughs> facilities, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, in your communities, engaging them, letting them shape their own future. And we've had these kinds of policies at the federal level in place, at a high level. There's no laws instituting environmental justice at the federal government, but there's an executive order that's been in place since President Clinton doing that work. And we've had a history of strong environmental justice advocacy in 
in Washington State from the early 90s. Senator Rosa Franklin, one of our first black female senators in Washington State, really laid the foundation that has that we I helped pick it back up in my work uh, over time. And also thinking about, you know, I, I got a lot of questions over the years, about like what's the difference between equity and environmental justice and climate justice? And they're really different shades of the same kind of idea. Equity is seeks to see, ameliorate and eliminate all systemic disparities. Environmental justice is a smaller focus on that where we're focused on addressing environmental health disparities. And climate justice is a further sub, sub maybe of, of climate justice where you're centering on, the, on mitigating the impacts, mitigating uh, and arising, uh, arising from climate change. My work at, well, I, after leaving the mayor's office uh, after a few years, I started my own consultancy uh, organization called Inclusive Solutions. And there, one of my main clients was front and centered. And when I got there, this work was very much on its way to being completed, creating the environmental health disparity map, really encourage folks to look at it. It's a statewide map that um, takes all these factors of environmental exposure, uh, proximity to highways, proximity to toxic sites, and socioeconomic factors, amount of income, average income, presence of cardiovascular disease, housing affordability, and creates a disparities rank of one through 10. One being you don't have very few disparities, 10, you have the most disparities. And, and we've done this work across the state down to the census tract level. So you can see at your own, you can enter in your address and see what kind of disparities are present in your community. The impact, and we've also had this analysis done where you show the impact. And what you see is that the higher on the scale you are of one through 10, the more diverse. So race is one, the leading factor to determine whether you live in a, in, in a community that has lots of health disparities driven by environmental toxins and, and pollution. It also results in lower life expectancy. Our average life expectancy in Washington state is 80.5 years. If you live in one of the healthier communities in our state, you can expect to live two years longer than that. But if you live in one of our most unhealthy, you're living about four years less than that. So this is quite literally life and death issues that we're trying to address through environmental justice. So in coming into this organization, I saw this opportunity of taking this map. I didn't want it to be just sat in a wall and stared at occasionally by staff. I wanted to, how do we reject them and make them into, so I had this German of idea that I it went back to the front and center coalition and we developed the full compo the full heel act as a cohort, as a co coalition over many, over a few, the next few years. But it does a few things. Um, this, the, this is a, a graphic from our first version of HELAC. We didn't quite get all the way over the finish line with that. But what we did get from our first effort of trying to pass the HELAC in 2019 was a Washington State Environmental Justice Task Force. And this was, uh, we again, in, in, a, in, in a alliance with kind of our, the missions and values of environmental justice, we went across the state, nine different community conversations in, uh, for both front and center sponsored pre kind of conversations to let folks understand what the environmental justice task force was doing. And then the task force itself would show up when we could. We also did this during COVID in person, hearing directly from communities and all that input fed the final report that, based, that we based the last HEAL Act on. Also in 2019, we passed at the time the most equitable 100% uh, clean energy bill. That means we have no coal burning in our state by 2025. By 2030, we have a greenhouse neutral standard for our utilities. And by 2045, all of our utilities will be 100% clean. Some echo components that we put in that we put in that bill include all utilities have to provide low income assistance to, the, to their clients and tax incentives for clean energy projects that employ women minority, and also incentives for, or the, for the new infrastructure to be built, direction for utilities to build that in overburdened communities, so the opportunity for new jobs in the clean energy economy. But in 2021, we did get the HEAL Act through based off, you know, largely based off what was in the Environmental Justice Task Force report. It has this definition of environmental justice. It's a two-part definition. One part reflects the definition of environmental justice that's in our, our in the federal government executive order, which is about engaging communities. We added a further layer saying not just engaging, but the result of that has to be uh, changing the, the life of communities of color or, or impacted community, overburdened communities so that you actually address the problem and not just listening to itself. Uh, we have a permanent environmental justice council, which has 14 members, tribal government representatives, different community of color representatives. I'm there as a practitioner representative, someone who has experience in working in environmental justice. 
Um, and the seven agencies are directed as part of their core mission moving forward to address environmental justice. And what does that mean? They have to, before they build, a, for, before the Department of Transportation builds a road now that's over $15 million, they will have to do an environmental justice assessment to understand what the impacts of that road might be in a community and how to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms in the final design. And another benefit is creating an interagency work group to work in conjunction with the council that will, what I found in my initial work with different state governments was they were talking about wanting to do environmental justice and talking with us at Front and Centered, but we're talking to each other. And so this is a table for cross-agency collaboration as well. Um, we want to embed in strategic plans and develop community engagement, uh, community engagement plans focused on environmental justice and uh, a goal of equitably distributing our state environmental uh, investments with 40% of those investments going towards impacted communities. We also passed the Climate Commitment Act and there's a few main components of that. There's the what's called the cap and trade system, creates a price of carbon and a declining amount of what's called allowances. Essentially, it's like a permission to permute. You have to purchase these in an auction. There are less of these every year leading to our, our reduction. This covers 75% of our greenhouse gases in Washington, covers the largest polluters of our in our state. And so they all will have this direction of reducing their pollution over time. But what we saw in other states was that that policy was falling short, a cap and trade program, by not addressing air quality in uh, overburdened communities. So we added in Washington state a new program addressing that, that covers not just our largest polluters, but anyone who has permission to emit in Washington state will be covered by this program that starts at first with air monitoring to understand what the current situation is in our state and is setting a target for reducing our air quality so to reach healthy levels. And if we're not seeing that kind of reduction being met, that the Department of Ecology is empowered to create new regulations to ensure we meet those goals. Throughout the bill, there's different ways of, of addressing environmental justice to ensure we meet these goals, especially when it comes to um, in, uh, overburdened communities. A key aspect is the money this bill raises. It's gonna raise $7 billion by 2037. 5.2 billion was just assigned through the Move Ahead Washington Act, which is the state's largest investment in public transportation, in walking and mobility and bike kind of infrastructure. Um, our state has typically only invested about 2% of our state transportation budget in these kind of investments. We're now up to 22%. So a huge increase thanks to the investments from the Climate Commitment Act. And also a first in our state requirement in state law to have 35% of all these investments go towards overburdened communities, 10% in tribal lands, and 20 million dedicated for that air quality work and some also some other investments that are needed as well. We also did a lot of good work this past session. Uh, the move ahead bill, I just uh, transportation investments I just mentioned, clean energy siting. We have all these requirements of getting us to a clean energy economy. We need to ensure that we actually will build the infrastructure needed. And so how do we improve some of our processes? Our, our environmental protection acts have really done a great job of keeping bad projects out. Unfortunately, they can be misused by you know NIMBY type folks who don't want infrastructure in their backyard because they're wealthier, they don't like the way it obstructs their views. And so how do we maintain our environmental standards, build this clean energy economy without kind of running into these crossroads of that kind of concern? Focused efforts on methane pollution, which is one of the most uh, intense greenhouse gases. And then how do we do a sprawl loophole in our Growth Management Act that would continue to allow kind of exurban development um, based on how quickly you can work around the system. And so those are all, there's still a lot to, more work to do. The rules for the Climate Commitment Act are being undergone right now. We need to do work to save our salmon across our state. Uh, clean buildings. Buildings are the, one of the largest areas of continued pollution. And how do we get uh, our, our buildings off natural gas and using things like heat pumps to both heat and cool our housing? And how do we conserve and reforest 2 million acres? These are all challenges that the environmental community at large and the Nature Conservancy are taking on today. And that I got through it all in a very quick time. So I hope that was understandable for folks. Yes, thank you so much again um, for your presentation. I know that I've learned a lot and I'm sure many, many other folks here um, also have learned a lot of really awesome things today. Just as a reminder, if anyone is interested in submitting a Q&A, you can use the Q&A feature. Um, I will be monitoring those. However, for starters, we actually have a question for you um, from an SU community member. 
for the HEAL Act, have the parameters for the environmental justice assessment been established? No, they haven't. That's one of our main goals. So those, the agencies have until next July to actually start using that. And so our Environmental Justice Council had our first meeting in April. One of our first tasks is to make recommendations to the agencies of what are those parameters, how should they conduct these assessments. In addition to the community engagement plans that are required, we're also going to make recommendations on that. And then also making recommendations on the rules related to the Climate Commitment Act on ensuring that we're meeting our environmental justice goals um, and reducing pollution and overburdened communities. Absolutely. Um, a secondary question that we also have from the community, I think we'll have time for this one and one more um, before the end of our time. What legislative initiatives have you seen fail that could have succeeded with more advocacy from the public? Well, that's, that's hard. I think, you know, the ones that are fresh in my mind as of this year is the and it's, it's hard because some of this stuff is very dense and it's hard to public message things like um, denser housing, right? And so one of, you know, for folks not tracking what this means is, you know, the city of Seattle is about 60% single family zones where you can't even build duplexes or triplexes. There is a really important bill to kind of mandate the ability to build duplexes and triplexes in communities across the state. And I got so close to the finish line, but it didn't quite get there. And unfortunately, we need that density in order to ensure we're not continuing our sprawl. We can create these walkable communities like a number of our speakers have talked about today um, because we need that kind of dense population to support businesses, local businesses and communities and like um, and create more affordability is, you know, uh, it's kind of outrageous how, how quickly prices are rising for housing in, in this city and especially, um, but across the state as well. Yes, totally. Uh, I know many students are often struggle with that um, affordability of living in Seattle. I know I do. Um, one final question for you before we start to head off. As someone, um, this is coming from me, um, and I'm just, I'm fascinated, you know, in the world of conservancy and policy legislation and action, how what advice can you give for setbacks that are experienced in the field? You know, I used to work as a um, uh, a signatures gatherer for a lot of initiatives and petitions, and you spend all of this time and effort and energy trying to, to work on these really great things that are super important for the world. And then sometimes they fail uh, and you have to figure out what to do after that happens. I'm wondering if you can give some advice to sort of our community and the other students and community members who might be working towards this, but are feeling those setbacks. Yeah, no, I, I feel that. And, you know, I, I, I think I've really focused at the state and, and local level because there is so much more opportunity to succeed in the, the things that we want. Um, I think there's, we should, the federal government needs to weigh in, but there's just, you can feel a little bit small when you're trying to do work at that national kind of level. And so that's where I encourage folks, to, if you want to ensure you find hope, not work at, at both as much as you can. We need support at all levels of advocacy. And there's always lessons and loss to be had. Like what didn't resonate? What, you know, how did your message get lost in the opposition, right? You know, before we got the Climate Commitment Act, we had two statewide initiatives for carbon taxes in our state that both failed. Uh, one that didn't have a broad environmental community or people of color support and one that did and it still didn't get through. And so what did we learn from those experiences that led us to the success? We, we took those lessons of what failed, what didn't work, you know, how our messaging got and got to go kind of got away from us, our advocacy got away from us, and we were able to pivot and, and move forward in, in new ways uh, to get the things like the Heal Act and the Climate Commitment Act, um, even the year that, you know, at, right after the, the, you know, the last carbon tax initiative failed, we were able to get the 100% clean energy bill. And so it's maybe we aren't able to get that thing that was in front of you, but the energy and coalition work shouldn't just be lost and dissipate. Take the energy and refocus it into the new direction on, you know, I think there's always, we want, we will all want large systemic change. Sometimes we can't get there in one bill. So what are those changes that it's, it's you know, a third of what you wanted, but it's still that third that sets the new baseline that you can build on from there. And so look at, look at losses in that kind of way. What, what did we learn? 
how can we build a new path to at least part of our victory before we get the whole thing? Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. So I will just say thank you again for coming and speaking with all of us uh, at Earth Talks this year. And I will pass it back off to Dr. Thompson to wrap us up. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you much, Marika, for moderating our keynote speakers today. And David, thank you for such an excellent presentation. You really do have your finger on the pulse of the state legislature. And I've learned so much today. It's really terrific. And thank you to all of our speakers today at our third annual Earth Talks event. And for all of you who, who uh, spent time with us today, really appreciate it. So happy Earth Day. Get out there in the sunshine while it's still with us. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next year. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.